welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to uh, get this started. So we're going to call the meeting to order. The first thing to do is re um, to review and approve the agenda. Um, there had been a couple of addendums um, to the agenda from its original posting. I think they're both on the online version of the agenda. So one of them is the discussion of a, uh, well, one of them was going to be a um, consent agenda item. Um, so that I think that's, that's, uh, that's just the minutes. And then um, the other one is the discussion of a proposed uh, charter amendment. Um, so I'd like to put that in under, like right after, um, uh, after item seven, uh, which is after the uh, Green Mountain Transit. And so we can call that item seven and a half, maybe. Um, all right, so any other things to add to the agenda? Okay, so without objection, we're gonna consider the uh, agenda approved. Can you hear me okay? Okay, just checking. Uh, great, okay, so uh, next up, general business and appearances. This is a time for anyone from the public to address the council on any item that is otherwise not on our agenda. Um, and if you'd say your name and where you're from and try to keep it to two minutes. Great, go ahead. Or I think I, I if you need five, it's okay. Time. <coughs> My name is Roberta Garland, and I'm uh, live on Wilson Street, Montpelier. Is this on? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Oh, can you hear me? Anyway? I can put that down. Oh, I'm sorry. There might be a switch. <coughs> it's a minor comment. Oh, edge there. They're right. 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 They're Anyway, I'm just giving an, a short update about the um, non-citizen voting, um, where we're at, because things, things are kind of moving ahead. Um, Sheila and Colin and John and myself and some other couple of people from the community have been meeting to come up with some strategies. And um, we're, we're um, looking at strategies to um, do some outreach to legislators as we get it going to the session to educate folks about what this chart, what the non-citizen voting means and um, kind of the ins and outs of it and to, to um, encourage them to be for it. Yeah. Anything else we should say about this, do you think? That's a great update, huh? Yeah? yeah? Okay, Thank just want to let people know about where we're at. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Um, Donna? I had some edits to the minutes. And I Can you, you use your mic? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. I had some edits to the minutes. They were not substantial, such as I was present and I'm not listed. <laughs> and a couple of other things that's are. Substantial. I think that's pretty <laughs> substantial, Donna. <laughs> Incomplete sentences. So it's not the minutes in its whole, just some little grammar pieces that. And I had a copy, and I'm sorry I didn't bring it with me, but if I could pass that on to her, I'd appreciate, especially so being present. So uh, potentially we could approve them um, uh, with your adju um, adjustments. Yep. Thank you. Does that. Sound reasonable? Or, or we could wait. What's your preference? Why don't we just take the edits next time and approve it next time okay. around? Okay. Okay. So we're gonna Sorry. not. Oh, that's the only item on the consent agenda. So uh, okay. we're just gonna keep moving then. Uh, all right. So uh, now we get to do, make some appointments. So I know we have some folks here who are. Uh, interested in, well, I should say, really young people who are interested in serving on some of our city committees. And I'm very excited to um, have uh, more young people involved on uh, in, in the city business and on city committees. So uh, if you are up for it, you don't have to, but if you're up for it, if you would like to come up to the mic, introduce yourself, and uh, say why, what committee you're interested in and maybe uh, a little bit about why you're interested in it. And you could also sit at the table. Those are mics on the table, too, if you don't e want to use that. Either way is fine. Also, don't feel like you have to. That's the other cool thing about this. Yeah. If yeah. you want to, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want you on. My name is Jasper Eklund from Montpelier, and um, I would like, I want to, like, do energy and committee and 
conservation committee. Um, and yeah, because I want to make, I want to help Montpelier in its nature ways, like help it make the Hubbard Park path like kind of have more stuff and st and protect the animals from like getting hurt and stuff. So yeah. Great. Could I ask you a question, Jasper? Yeah. Um, I was, well, first of all, I really enjoyed reading through your application. Um, I saw that you were interested in two committees. Do, would your preference to be put on just one or both? Um. And there's no pressure. You can also come. You can also go talk about it um, with your mom if you want, and then come back <laughs> and let us know what you think. Okay. I'm going to try one. <laughs> Just one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and do you have a preference for which one, or does it matter? What do you think would be more, a, a child's voice would be more helpful? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think there's a couple of factors in there. Uh, I mean, from what you described, uh, it sounds a little bit more like conservation commission, yeah. mm -hmm. but I could, I could be wrong. That's what I was going to say too. I think it'd be great on either one, but uh, I think the focus sounds like more conservation commission, maybe. Okay. What do you think? Yeah, I think I would like to do conservation too. Okay. Awesome. Great. Super. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. Um, my name is Lily Fournier. I'm a student at Montpelier High School. I live up by Vermont College. Um, and I, I'm not sure what the right verb is, want to be on, have been going to some meetings for the Historic Preservation Commission, um, which has, is really cool. I really like it. I think one of the things that makes Montpelier and lots of Vermont and honestly New England special is that the buildings are unique wherever you go because people just built them differently, um, different places, and so that's something that I think is a huge part of Montpelier's character that I want to continue to be a part of protecting. Super. I think that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Super. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Uh, I'm Emery Richardson. Uh, I've lived in Montpelier all my life, and uh, I want to be part of the Planning Commission. Uh, I applied for both the Complete Streets Group and the Planning Commission, but I want to be on the Planning Commission more because uh, I think that uh, it's really important to have youth's voices in the community, and I think that's a great way to do that. So. Super. Well, great. Any questions for Emery? Awesome. Well, so thankful uh, for your application. All right, so thank you so much. And so at this point, so you, you don't have to hang out up here if you don't want to. Um, <laughs> uh, so but you can. <laughs> but you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also thank you for that clarification about which committee you would want, want to be on. That's great. Um, all right, I don't think we need to go into any. Um, I, well, is, um, is Ian Keen? Ian Keen is not here. I know he's not here, but is he still, is, his application hasn't been withdrawn. No, but it, because it's an ex officio position. Oh, okay, I, was, I thought there was one per, okay. Yep, then I, I think it's probably fine. Would you agree? <laughs> I, I think it's, agree. I think we get to appoint multiple people to the Conservation Commission and it's I love it. perfectly okay. Um, okay, so, um, uh, all right. Uh, anybody like to make a motion? I Does anybody have it all oh. together? Am I supposed? Well, okay, that's a really broad question, Anne, and I don't have it all together. <laughs> Just fair. want to be clear that's about fair. that. I'm sure most people know that. But um, so at this point, I would move that we appoint um, Jasper Eckland to the Conservation Committee. That we appoint. Oh. 
list go? I lost it. The next one's Lily Fournier. Yes, that we appoint Lily Fournier to the Historic Preservation uh, Committee, that we appoint Ian Keene to the Conservation Committee, and that we appoint Emery Richardson to the Planning Commission. All as ex officio. As position. ex officio members, yes. I'll second. Further discussion? Are you Don't. using that <coughs> to mean non-voting? Because I thought we found out that didn't mean non-voting. In this case, it, I think it, we're going to, yes, it, it does mean non-voting. That's the intent, to mean non-voting. Ex officio non-voting members. I amended my motion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Glenn, did you have something to add? That was it. Okay. Uh, Rosie. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm always surprised during our appointments of adult members to the committees how qualified all of the, the folks that we have are and, and what knowledge and background they bring. And I was amazed and, and pleased to see how qualified even our student members are. Um, <laughs> certainly not something we expect, you know, we're expecting that, that our student members are just interested in a topic, but um, frankly, uh, some of them were extremely qualified and had lots of background uh, experience. So it's, you know, wonderful to be in the position of appointing people to committees in Montpelier. Um, just wanted to yeah. acknowledge that. Yeah, I'm really excited about uh, all the interest that uh, students had in all these city committees. It's really, it's really wonderful that you all want to serve. So, uh, great. All right. So, for the discussion. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Great. Thank you all so much. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, okay. And we'll let those committee chairs know that... And there's that no requirement that you stick around for the rest of the meeting, yeah. unless you really want to. Yeah. Well, yeah, and we'll let the committees know to expect you. Okay, so um, we have another appointment to the Central Mont uh, Internet uh, Group, and it is for the alternate position. We had two applicants, and I know you're both here. Uh, do, would you like... I know you had the opportunity last time to say something. Um, do, would you like to say anything further or... What not? If not, that's fine. Up to you. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I just want to affirm to you folks, but also to the folks in the public. Um, you know, certainly, my name's Ken Jones, um, and I've had other positions with the city, but more importantly for this discussion, I work at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and one of the most important aspects of both commerce and community development in the state is the expansion of broadband um, and therefore the work that I do during the day uh, some of the work that I do during the day is on this topic so I've been asked up there to provide assistance to those folks support, uh, developing community communications union districts and so I would uh, is a reason why I'm uh, interested excited enthused uh, about this position Great. very good thank you any questions Go ahead. Our question is, um, um, like I said last time, my opinion hasn't changed. I'm Richard Littauer. Uh He's much more qualified. I should probably get it. <laughs> um, the reason I'm talking here, I was going to bring it up in the beginning, but I missed it. Um, I really appreciate it if we could uh, implement a policy where if the secretary is sick or the clerk is sick, that. Uh, someone else gets the email, because it's kind of awkward to be like, hey, I applied for that, and I didn't get it. Um, I'm pretty loud spoken. I don't really mind, but other people might not be. So that'd be cool. Uh, otherwise, he should get it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a point well taken about having a um, procedural policy if uh, Jamie is out. So um, uh, do we want to go into executive session team? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I move that we go into executive session pursuant to one VSA section three thirteen. Is there a second? <laughs> second. second. <laughs> no. Okay. For the discussion. Uh, um, all right. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. All right. We will be right back. Okay. A motion to come out of executive session. So moved. So. Second. Uh, for the discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Do we have a motion? I move to uh, appoint uh, Ken Jones to the uh, remainder of the term for the uh, Central Vermont Internet Board. 
And this is as an alternate? For the remainder of the yeah. term. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, second. Uh, for the discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And we just want to acknowledge, um, uh, we're so grateful, actually, that you are interested in this. We hope that you, we would encourage you to go to these meetings. They are public. And we also just want to acknowledge that it's wonderful that you've been to our meetings for the past few. And that that's not, uh, you know, that doesn't happen all the time. And so we, we hope that you stay involved and encourage you to, um, you know, stay open to um, uh, other possibilities. So, uh, and plus these, uh, these seats will become open, or they'll be up for reappointment uh, later next year well like sometime like spring. Ma May. yeah the spring so thank you okay and thank you ken okay okay <laughs> fabulous Great. perfect okay so we have an update um and uh some uh, a budget report from the green mount yeah gmt come on up good evening good evening Madam Mayor, Councilors, I appreciate you allowing me to be here tonight. Um, this is my visit for the, um, to kind of update the Council on uh, what's been going on at Green Mountain Transit. Um, what I'm passing around right now is, uh, as you may have heard, we've started a next-gen 18-month um, oh, study on our complete service Mark, um, throughout. Yep. You might want to introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Mark Seuss, uh, General Manager. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. <laughs> Um, I am the general manager of Green Mountain Transit, have been there for now uh, two years, a little over two years. Um, so I wanted to come tonight uh, uh, to go back into the next gen uh, information, which is the next kind of a next generation of what Green Mountain Transit is doing for the future. And uh, looking out, it was an 18 month uh, project that included all the service area that we provide. We're in five counties. Um, we are. Um, the providers of uh, Sugarbush stove service as well, and uh, Franklin Grand Isle, and of course uh, Washington County. Um, what I tried, what I was trying, was was going to do tonight is there's the Montpelier circulator um, has been. Uh, we've been talking about that every year that I've come, and I just wanted to kind of update you where we are on what the next steps are um, in this next gen study. What you'll see is there's an implementation implementation timeline, which is the first page kind of gives you an idea of the three uh, urban, rural, and seasonal services that we provide. The, these, this timeline is very fluid because of uh, public hearings that we have to have, um, and we're trying to kind of do the urban and rural. Uh, right now, we're kind of working on the rural. We, we will be working the urban. When I say urban, I mean Chittenden County. So right now, we're working on the, the rural, the rural uh, timeline. Um, and I kind of, it, it, like I said, it will push some things out because of, of, of timing, public hearings, et cetera. Uh, but this gives you a general sense of what we're looking to do. Um, the first, we have two scenarios right now. One scenario is um, scenario one, which is uh, it's, it's basically some service that is currently goes um, kind of an opposite direction, but is currently has been um, designed to um, maximize the area of um, the city. As you'll see, very colorful, um, but it kind of gives you an idea of exactly what, what, what we're going to present as one option. Uh, and then the second scenario is what we call a bi-directional. The bi-directional ha goes basically back and forth. It gives, you more, it gives you more service and time points, but what it does, it also misses an area. Uh, if you'll see in the... Um, it was a college green, I think it is. Is that right? Yep. You'll, you'll lose the, that area over there. So we want to put this out to the public so the public has a say in what this looks like. Can I ask a couple you of sure questions? You sure can. And just freedom drive. And freedom, and freedom drive. But I will, I'll explain freedom drive. Um, okay, so just for clarity, so there are uh, <clears throat> three different co uh, colored routes on here. So one of them is magenta, green, and orange. Those are the current route system. Um, so which... Could you could you just like tell me which ones are which, like which is the? I I, I don't know because they okay. changed the color scheme on me. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but like, but one of them represents the circulator. One of them is like the city loop. Right. 
the, okay. the way I'm reading it, the magenta one is the the circulator, and that's the one that changes from one map to the next. Okay. Okay. So, and and that's the one that's sort of at at play here is should the circulator do the scenario one or scenario two? All right. Okay. I thought the circulator went out Elm Street, which is green on this Th map. This is this is a a um, uh, the next step on what was designed by our consultant. So this isn't current, this is what we're presenting to the public and for options. Okay. But currently I have people who are using it on Elm Street and are afraid of losing it. So that's what the green is on this map. I, I believe you're probably right on that. I don't, think, I don't think you're losing it. So if the current is both the green and the magenta? No, I think the current is not shown. Correct, the current is not shown here. This is what we're presenting as options. And that's why I'm bringing it forward to, to, the, to the council because eventually when the public hearing comes out, this is what we'll be presenting. And we, are, we have plenty of time to, to have input from public. This is why we're kind of doing this because we want to hear from them what they, what they think. Also, I, can, I may add, we're also implementing complementary ADA uh, into this area, which we never have, have deviated fixed route. So when you do complement, complementary ADA, it's mandated by the federal government. You go three quarters of a mile off the route. And so that will pick up some of these other areas that we were you were talking about. Um, Freedom Drive, Freedom Circle, that we've checked into that and that they're actually qualified to be able to get the complementary ADA so they won't lose service. So that it's complementary, so it's just sec it's secondary to the, to the fixed route. Well, that can so, but those are also public hearings. Um, Ashley, do you have a question? So yeah, sure. I just want to make sure that I'm clear. So with ADA, though, that's only for folks protected by the ADA. Correct. Right. Okay. So I just, I, full disclosure, I lived on Barry Street uh, for at least part of my time on the council and for several years before that, and I'm quite concerned that that proposal two cuts out, in essence, all service to Barry Street other than ADA. Um, you know, the co-op is there, it stops at the, I believe it actually, the circulator stops at the co-op, if I'm not mistaken. It does now. Do, yeah. It, something does. Or it, it stops close to there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, um, the senior center as well, I, I just feel like that's a, that's a major cut. The senior center provides you know, a, a place for lots of members of our community to go and to be, um, and and not just for seniors either. There are lots of classes that you can take there, um, and and I, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm really uh, it's a hard no for me on this second proposal um, because that uh, cuts out a lot of folks who who need this. Um, and uh, as a former resident of Barry Street, I am intimately familiar with, you know, uh, the happenings and, and, you know, like I see lots of folks walking to work, you know, when I was living on Barry or walking to the bus stop to get to work. And when I leave for work, uh, in theory, on time, which hasn't happened for a while, but, um, you know, there's lots of folks waiting for the bus down there. Uh, and and I just I, I cannot support a plan that cuts out bus access for that many residents of our community um, and, and particularly. Um, you know, how diverse the Barry Street neighborhood is um, and, and just the sort of um, diverse ridership that I know relies on this to get where they need to get to be um, members of our community. Thank you. That you're not voting. You don't really have... No, I know, uh, okay. but I, I just... So I just, want the, I just want the council to know that this was done by a third-party consultant that does this all over the country. They're the ones who make th these recommendations based on demographics, um, based on um, household demographics, et cetera. And so I, I'm, I'm, th this is a common conversation we have. Mm -hmm. That's why this is not a done deal. This is just an FYI for the council. So when the public hearing does come, um, you know, councilors are allowed to um, obviously be there and, and state their, their objections to certain areas or add um, service. So we can, it doesn't mean we can't add to this, to these uh, recommendations. Right. Great. And, and I, I just, I want to, this is one of the things that we've been trying to sort of tackle uh, in, in the committee that I formed, but um, I, I love public hearings. I think public hearings are critical to these conversations, um, but there are lots of voices that are, are left out of those, of those uh, conversations. And, um, you know, I, I know that there, you know, there, there probably is some data to support all this, and this is in no way, uh, you know, to undermine or 
uh, in any way discredit the work that, that this organization has done. Um, but, you know, as someone who represents a large uh, segment of our community, District 3, um, my, you know, the, the residents in my district are, are human beings who have needs that uh, if, if the council is, you know, is sort of looking at this only um, as a map, um, sort of really misses out on how critical these services can be for people in our communities. And so I know, I know, I have no doubt that this is supported. I just want to sort of bring that human element back that, um, you know, while money is important, uh, people's lives are also important. And some of these services, uh, you know, Central Vermont substance abuse, um, prescription services at pharmacies in the area, shopping, grocery shopping, um, you know, reach up. These are critical services that our community relies on to literally survive. Um, and I want to make sure that that is an ongoing part of the conversation if, if anyone is seriously considering um, the at least proposal one on here. Or two, two. Thank you. Yep. I don't disagree with <laughs> a lot of what you said. So um, the last page is the Michael Transit, I believe. There was a counselor that went to the, you did right Donna, that's what I thought um, went to the Mike transit uh, meeting I was not there but this was part of this part of the pre presentation I believe it's an ongoing monthly um, meeting uh, with a recommendation I believe coming out sometime in February or March uh, and VTrans is actually um, uh, a, a kind of spearheading these these conversations so um, we're involved in Greenmount Transit involved there's a lot of stakeholders that are involved in the, in the micro transit so great. The only other, the only other thing I'd like to bring up is just kind of give you an over, a, kind of an overview of how much rides we provided in the central Vermont area. Um, 336,248, excluding the Montpelier link. Uh, that's just the service that we provide locally. Um, part of what we're trying to do is be a little bit more efficient with the dollars, and by doing so, uh, hopefully, with that and, and the ADA, complimentary ADA coming into place, that ridership we're looking to put ridership move ridership up it's actually has an uptick right now um, so it's actually uh, going in the right direction uh, and the Montpelier um, circulator service had 16,686 rides last year so that's kind of what I have I entertain any questions or comments? Um, I have a quick question um, uh, you said there was an uptick in ridership. Is that, uh, are you seeing that statewide or is it just Montpelier or both? Nationally. Nationally. So nationally, we, we've done our peer, we have a, a peer group. Um, we have approximately, I want to say uh, 30 other agencies that are, are similar size, similar budgets, similar ridership, uh, similar service area. And we basically, about a year, a little over a year ago, we did, uh, uh, study to see why our ridership had gone down. We were down six percent, uh, and so we, when we did this peer study, uh, we actually found that nationally, um, the average was almost between six and ten percent. Some were actually down twenty-two mm -hmm. percent. So nationally, when gas prices are low, mm -hmm. public transit usually takes a, a, a hit on ridership. Um, so gas, the, gas prices go up a little bit. Yeah, ridership goes up a little bit. So the Montpelier's numbers are also up. Yes. Okay. Um, Connor and then Rosie. Yeah, just, <clears throat> just a couple of quick questions there. Um, enjoying being on that state micro transit committee with Donna there, and uh, it's great to work with some of your guys on that too. Uh, looking at the numbers here, I'm looking at the Montpelier circulator, 205,000, the yearly costly estimate, that's 16,686 there for ridership. So it comes out to like about 12 bucks a ride. Does that sound right? Yeah, I believe that's probably true. I don't have the data with me okay. today, but it sounds about right. Can I ask you just like broadly, as you're looking at the micro transit option, mm -hmm. some of your folks are serving on like the mm -hmm. state committee, um, does that idea like strike you as far-fetched as you're just hearing this? You know, the micro transit? Move it to like an Uber no. run model? Okay. Not at all. Is that something that GMT would be interested in running like you're doing there? Absolutely. It is, okay. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. Good. I've got a number of questions. Um, one is I want to get some clarity on what the two proposals are showing for Elm Street. I know um, Donna and I have been contacted by several constituents who are really concerned about losing the Elm Street service because that had been my understanding of the original proposal and what the board had voted to accept last year, maybe. Um, and 
I understand that, and I think this may have happened since some of the studies went into place or were taken, um, but that there are several daycare centers that are using <coughs> the Elm Street section to get out to the rec fields and the nature center. And I want to make sure that that, if it is indeed more recent, that that is reflected in, um, you know, what your, the data that you're using to make these decisions. Okay. Um, there is, you know, CCV is out there in the rec center and, and some other um, important locations out there. So I just wanted to make sure that that's on your radar and hear what the, the current plan is. Yeah, I don't, um, the, the current plan are the two plans that, that are in front of you. We haven't changed anything since the last time that I was at, at here. The, this has not been implemented at all. So what was there is still there. Uh, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to make notes for your concerns because I'll bring it back to my planning staff. So what's the green route through the Meadows neighborhood that's shown here? Because my understanding of, of the proposal before was that it was basically going to stop at Elm and Spring, and that was as far down that uh, stretch as it, as it was going to go. Uh, like I said, I don't have a much bus map guide. Here's Elm, and this is the roundabout. Now it goes beyond and goes along the rec field. Oh, right. Okay, so it's the rec field. We've so been told that it's scheduled to stop here. I, I, believe the rec, I believe the rec field was added to that route to go out there and come back. Uh, because of the because of the responses they received during public hearings. Okay, so there is a change from the initial For, plan I that was presented. This has been a flu very fluid document. Mm -hmm. So every time we go to a public hearing, we kind of add all comments into the you know the, the uh, formula, if you will, and then we, we, the consultant starts looking at things a little bit. You know, like, okay, mm -hmm. is this needed? Is this a necessity? Then they'll do the demographics, and so I would say that that was added probably because of a public hearing. Okay, it would be great if we could get a solid answer to, to give back to our constituents on that because that's not the that's original. not my understanding of how it had been so I, I would like to be able right. to, to say that for sure um, uh, my next question is I'm a little bit confused about your actual request because there's the forty thousand dollars for the circulator and then there's the twenty nine thousand dollars for general participation in the Bill service can answer that is this le is this Level the same as last year. Okay. So, so we, we're show, we're just showing one line in the budget for seventy thousand, okay. which was forty for the circulator and thirty for their operating. It was actually twenty nine and change. But, okay. Uh, and that's the same that we had last year. Okay. So. Great. Um, and um, I also I think I raised this last year, but I'm just curious as we um, consider how we handle the circulator in Montpelier. Um, right now we subsidize it and don't charge, and it's free. And I'm just curious about what the thought is about um, charging for riders who can afford it, still offering the, um, the subsidies that you offer across all your services for low-income folks and seniors, um, but charging a little bit for that service. And does that mean that we can serve more or serve more often? Or is the cost of collecting fares so much that it isn't worth doing? It, it, so the fair, there was a fair analysis done when we did the, this next-gen study as well. So that's part of the... Um, uh, do board document that was adopted by our board and we're discussing fares right now we do have some that are fare free uh, throughout our system and then there's some that pay and should there be a fare increase for, for that so those are the discussions that are actually happening now that we'll be presenting so part of this final document that you, you'll ultimately see there will be a recommendation on fares okay so and that's something that I would if a fare increase allowed us to expand service and do it more frequently or, you know, serve more areas, that is something I would be really interested in exploring. I'm not sure uh, what other folks think about that um, with the understanding that we're, we do have some methods for uh, subsidizing it for folks who can't mm -hmm. afford it. Um, and then um, I don't fully understand the microtransit proposal. I haven't really been involved in those conversations, and I wondered if you could just give a little bit of a summary of what that conversation is and how GMTA would be involved in that well, I think actually the members that were on the committee could probably answer that question <laughs> better than I could because I wasn't at the meeting but I uh, the, the understanding about microtransit is basically putting a bubble over the city of Montpelier and, pe and people would call for rides and basically like an uber um, I don't want to use that but uh, that they would actually right, call sure. for like a demand yeah. res response ride and within that bubble and if I if, am I is that yeah, the, the idea is having the technology and app to make it more uh, responsive 
so that you could also share, hopefully, that sure. ride, not just ride yourself like Uber in a taxi. But so far, it's only been done in larger communities. So we're, the whole group is looking at all of that closely. So the idea is that GMTA would run that rather than a private company such as an uh, Uber or Maybe. A There's or private companies who put in bids who are participating in the study. Okay who have the technology that right mm -hmm. now GMT doesn't have but wants to have. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? That's, a, that's for another discussion yeah, another day. <laughs> if um, I can chime in, Rosie, just yeah, on sure. that. I, like, I have to say, when I'm looking at like 12 bucks a ride here, right? And it's, okay, 45 rides a day for $205,000 a year. It seems like there are other options worth considering, so I'm really happy you're saying that. Uh, because if you do take, I'll say the word Uber in Boston or something, most of those trips are going to cost a lot less, you know? So I think it's, it's a very broad discussion at this point. Uh, but just looking at the numbers who live in each community and where they travel on a daily basis, I think it's worth digging into. So we just had the one meeting, but um, I'll be interested. Anything further? Uh, I think I'm good for now. Uh, Donna, then Jack. Well, I'm going to jump to the price because the $12 an hour, again, I was glad you brought up. It's right. national norms dealing with population base and especially routes that have any kind of small neighborhoods and door-to-door -door response is more in the neighborhood of $20 per ride. So you have to look at the, what the norm is for the population base and what that route is doing. Is it a fixed route or is it a more of a door-to-door -door response? Uh, so, and I would also concern, I'm glad to hear that you're taking in input because I went back online to look at the posted uh, next gen study and I didn't see any revision dates. And so I do have concern about the circulator in Elm Street. As <coughs> Rosie mm -hmm. said, we have constituents who are concerned. But I also have concern for changes you're doing to Hospital Hill or pro proposed to do a Hospital Correct. Hill and a hospital. Uh, Hill on Barry and Montpelier, as well as your city commuter, as well as a circulator. So in a time frame, when are we going to be able to have more input? I know that the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee is reaching out to you to come and meet and us to solicit, that group to solicit public input at that meeting because some of your meetings weren't well attended. I know the one here in Montpelier got canceled because of snow mm -hmm. and I don't know that it ever happened again in Montpelier. When I looked at the minutes of all your public meetings, there was no Montpelier meeting mentioned. Uh, so that concerns me that we hopefully we get you into that group and we have a, a more extensive discussion about this and we can see indeed whether it's making any impact of change. So. Yeah, so I think the timeline that we're working on right now, and again, very fluid timeline, is nothing would be implemented until uh, July 1 at the earliest. Meaning from now until then, you'll have several chances to meet, talk about it. So it's July, the, the, the at the earliest would be July 1. And so if the, the Transportation Infrastructure Committee had you come, would you also be able to bring fares and some of the other changes you're proposing besides just the routes that I found on sure. line. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good. Thank you. And I'll bring my planning staff who is <laughs> much more involved in this from the day to day. Uh, we're actually involved in the, in, in yeah. the actual yeah. study. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, just to add to that, to not beyond the um, Transportation Infrastructure Committee uh, hosting basically a public hearing um, on the uh, proposed route changes, uh, the Complete Streets Group is also going to be uh, hosting a uh, public hearing uh, doing the same so I'm um, I, I think that's wonderful to get uh, you know our committee is more involved in the in that process and um, I would love to see that be a, a more regular normal kind of thing for us uh, oh I th I'm sorry go ahead. I think Jack was next and then back to Rosie okay um, thanks for being here I have uh, I'm new to this because uh, I haven't I haven't been on the council before uh, one observation I would be make is that for future presentations like this I would find it useful to have the first map be what you have what you're doing right now so that then we can go from there to uh, to see what the proposed changes are because some of us don't use sure. the bus all the time and I think that would be very helpful um, I don't represent either Barry Street or uh, Elm Street, but I can tell you that every time 
GMT is mentioned in these meetings. We have people coming in saying they're really afraid that they're going to lose access to the service. And so uh, e even before you've heard had a public hearing in Montpelier, I can, I can tell you that this, it's a service that people really rely on and would be very unhappy to see, uh, see it go away. Um, I had a question about the uh, scenario three, the micro transit map. Um, it appears that uh, you're st you still have two of the uh, bus routes on here. And so is the model for this that you would maintain these two bus routes and then the uh, micro uh, transit or the uh, individually dispatched uh, jitneys would be uh, an overlay or a supplement to the uh, to the fixed routes? I think it's to be determined. Um, I think what you see here is some of these these routes right here actually go outside the bubble, if you will, and because of that, we have to continue. Well, I think they were continuing those to be outside that bubble, um, mm -hmm. and I think the bubble is really to be determined um, as as a group. I don't think they've really kind of pinned down exactly what that looks like uh, boundary-wise. So, can I add? Uh, the, the other thing about the microtransit, its focus is the last mile they talk about. So if you take the city commuter from Barrie into Montpelier, but they're not dropping you off close to your work or to your home, that then you could use the microtransit to do that last mile. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. You know, I know I have friends who used to drive the, the link up to Burlington, but it doesn't get you very close, necessarily get you close to your office. So, yep. same thing. Yep. Um, Rosie. But there's great service up in up in Burlington for our fixed route up there that covers most of the city. Well, they've got more population, so they can support it more yeah. easily, I'm sure. Good. Um, so, two more questions. Um, one is, obviously, we're getting our new bus station, hopefully by next summer, and I want to know how that fits into this, because it doesn't really feel like you know, all the stops are still, the overlapping stops are still at Shaw's and these, and um, we're hoping to not have all those buses lined up in front of yeah. Shaw's anymore. And those so will, that'll go away. Shaw's will go away. Well, once the DTC opens, and as construction goes on, it's, it's really hard to pin down a, a timeline, although I was with Bill earlier and having a conversation. It seems like it's on, on the right timeline in the fall. At that point, we'll have to move everything down to the DTC, and at that point, we'll have to actually have public hearings to move some of those stops so does it make sense to incorporate that all those changes into one time and maybe it doesn't but so that you're not altering routes for july 1st and then altering routes in october you know we can't be I, we can't kind of worry about like the construction could have a huge hiccup right mm -hmm. so we, if we wait longer we're trying to, to kind of get the impact of july 1 and then see where it goes now if we find out Bill's going to say that, hey, guess what? We have a magical date, and it's going to be summertime. Then maybe. Maybe that makes sense at that point. But Okay. Okay. Great question. Um, the other question I have is I know there have been some conversations with the school system. Um, at some point in the last year, I know they're thinking about adding service for middle school, school bus service for middle school students. And there was also some conversation about mm -hmm. being able to um, – Add service, I believe, up Berlin Street for a kind of an after-school late bus type service, and trying to work with GMTA on that. And I don't know what the results of those conversations were, or if anything is happening in yeah. that direction. So last summer there was a conversation, and this conversation came up, and the <coughs> school board, or school, I'm not sure it was the school board, but the, the um, principal or uh, superintendent uh, kind of backed away from that for this year. So we haven't come around since then. Okay. I would encourage you to reach back out and hopefully the folks who are involved in this here, um, maybe some of our committees could, could make that connection again because if we are adding some more school bus service, it, which isn't our decision here, but if, if the um, school system is thinking about that, it seems like there is room for some more conversation there for next year. Yeah, school, so school service, uh, we have that up in Burlington. It's called uh, School Trippers. Um, it's a, still a, a public transit system mm -hmm. so anybody can still get on those aren't just specific for schools yeah okay. I just want to clarify that because sometimes people think well 
you know, why can't you do it? Well, the Federal Transit Administration doesn't allow us to do that. Uh, no, it makes sense. No, I, yeah. I think that it, I think there's some, um, some sense in having one bus serve both needs, so. Oh, um, Ashley and then Donna. Um, so, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to this, but I noticed that regardless of which plan, so whether we do the micro transit scenario one or scenario two, there is consistently um, bus service to National Life. Is that something that National Life also pays for in part, or is that something that's funded by the city and GMTA, or how, what, like, how come the bus route is, encompasses National Life regardless of scenario one, two, or three? National Life does pay a fee to, to, to us. Okay. Um, and I think the state of Vermont too. State of Vermont. That. Now that, that's our next conversation about the state of Vermont moving um, down to Barry out of uh, National Life. Well, and then my agency is moving into National Life. So. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably going to be the same. Yeah. I um, guess yep. th just the the thing that stands out to me. I think microtransit is great. It works for someone like me, but I think that it's also important to be mindful that there are service areas. Um, you know, the hospital and, and things like that, where um, while the service is a great service for some people, it's, it's not something that would work for everyone. And some of those uh, services that are accessed on bus routes right now um, provide really critical support services and, and other things. Um, and uh, being able to sort of uh, establish a routine for some of it and um, some of those things are, I think it's incumbent upon us to be mindful that while microtransit's great um, for some members of our community and maybe for a whole bunch of them, um, I, I just, I don't want us to get away from sort of the public piece of public transportation to focus on the privatizing of that. I think it's an important partnership, but. Um, Donna and then Jack. And, mm, I, and then I'd, we should probably move yes. on soon. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I want to get back to Barry Street. One of the sad commentaries is the lack of senior ridership with the circulator going to the center that we as a city have not promoted and maybe give some enhancement to seniors to not bring their car to the center that has limited sp parking space as well as Barry Street um, so that we need to look to ourselves as a partner and promote among our citizen the awareness not to bring your car, but there are a little more time, you can take a bus. So I think we, mm -hmm. we need to be more active partners and likewise you need to be more active with us. Mm -hmm. That's also where the summer lunch program is at the senior center. And so I know I've, you know, I, I know because I used to live right across the street, I know how many people like take the bus and sort of come in and, and hang out until lunchtime and, and so I, I just, Important function. Well, it's important, but yes. we don't have the ridership we should. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Jack. I don't know if this uh, is the full solution, but I've, I've been hearing that uh, there, because of the uh, limited hours of the, of the bus routes, that there, there are people who are sometimes just at the hospital, they get out of diagnostic imaging or out of the emergency department or something, and they're stuck there at night, and uh, <coughs> you know the the health healthcare system doesn't necessarily work for people unless they have a lot of support outside of uh, the healthcare system. So, if you're looking at micro transit, one of the things I would encourage you to do is to think about uh, hours to see if it, it's possible to. Uh, Cover cover areas or cover times that the uh, bus uh, system can't. You know, one one, you know, one thing I think we're trying to get the hospitals to kind of understand is not all about fixing, but it's community. So how do we how do we work with the with the hospitals and 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 healthcare to help them um, get people to where they need to get to for appointments, et cetera, and not to just worry about getting them. You know, it's not all about just the the fixing them, but it's about the community health as well. And so mm -hmm. we've started that conversation. Uh, they're, qu they're not quite there yet, um, but I think eventually they're going to have to come around because it's starting to hit a national trend right now where hospitals and transit agencies are working together for the community. So Good. Great. Just one last thing, yeah. uh, Madam Mayor. I will tell you that the capital shuttle that we had approved for year-round service will actually end uh, at the end of the, this legislative session. So that kind of puts in a little bit of a... Um, 
curveball. So that we were notified by that uh, not too long ago. So. Okay. And I'm more than willing to, to any any committees that you would like us to be at, and okay. we'll make presentations. Just let us know, and we'll be there. Great, uh, Rosie. Just on that, is that a state decision? They're yes. funding that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. Nope. Just just a legislative se session. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Yep. For sure. Thank you. Okay. All right, so we're moving on to item seven and a half, uh, which is uh, the charter uh, amendment. And uh, so I just want to frame this uh, a little bit. So back um, in November when we, well, prior to November, when we were um, considering other another charter change, one of the possibilities um, was that it was uh, going to encompass all of sustainability, and so of course we decided to go with just plastics at that point. But that lost uh, a lot of potential uh, changes that could happen around energy efficiency, and so I know there was there were def we definitely got some calls about that, and I, I'm particularly interested in uh, being able to um, do some work in the city around energy efficiency in buildings. And uh, anyway, so we've got, so we, we got this language from uh, our lawyer not that long ago. Um, so he and I went back and forth a little bit uh, on this to tweak it a little bit. Um, so just a couple notes from him. Um, uh, so one, one of the things that he, um, I just want you to know that he had expressed was that uh, legally speaking, he didn't have any concerns about this language. Um, he did mention that, you know, it would be a political risk because uh, this is somewhat novel. This is uh, somewhat cutting edge for Vermont. And, uh, you know, we should just have our eyes open about that. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, another thing is that he, I mean, he uh, admitted that, like, he's not an energy expert. Um, and so I actually had the opportunity to run this language by some um, energy expert folks, including people from Efficiency Vermont and uh, Energy Futures Group. And they had a, a couple of um, not terribly substantial uh, edits to suggest, um, which I, I could um, tell you about or I can... Um, uh, um, s send later or either or both um, but the point of this time right now is to just get a general sense of like how are you feeling about it do you want to change something what's what, um, you know sort of where get, it's, this is more uh, temperature taking at this point um, and then we need to be if we want to do this then we need to be filing language uh, in early January um, so one of the things that I, I also want to point out about this is that this does uh, uh, open up the possibility for um, for, for us to, to create ordinances around energy efficiency, and that might seem kind of scary to, to some folks. Um, and so I've actually been working with uh, Efficiency Vermont uh, to put together a program specifically for Montpelier uh, that could uh, help make this um, just a little bit easier to achieve uh, for folks. And so Efficiency Vermont has agreed to uh, do a particular program with Montpelier, which I'm very excited to announce, um, which is uh, that we're calling it a concierge service, uh, which the, the idea is that uh, any uh, property owner uh, could work with a prepaid consultant uh, paid for through Efficiency Vermont uh, to help uh, anyone, but especially landlords, um, walk through uh, what the process would be to do energy improvements in uh, their buildings. So uh, the idea would be, you know, that this person would know all of the best pots of money or rebates or uh, incentives and uh, would be able to uh, help, help the, uh, the landowner um, uh, find the best deals and also walk them through doing the, the work. Um, so it's a it's a really exciting um, opportunity, and we're going to be talking more about that. That's going to be uh, available uh, in early January. So I just wanted to put that out there as well as part of the context for this. Um, and so one possibility is that we could just go around and you know what are what are our general thoughts or questions or comments. Um, another possibility is that I could tell you what the um, energy experts uh, advise we add. Um, I guess my inclination is to tell you that first, just because that seems like that would be uh, wise. Um, so I'm I'm looking at it right now. I haven't sent it to you all, um, but I can 
uh, I can tell you. Uh, I'll, I'll send this around later. So um, there was uh, uh, a reference in here to uh, the Vermont Energy Codes. That's sort of right there in the second line, I think. Um, that has a formal name, and so uh, we were advised by these energy folks to call it what its actual name is. So the, the first line um, would potentially read, uh, ordinance is establishing minimum uh, energy efficiency standards for buildings, which may incorporate technical requirements of the Vermont residential building energy standards, quote, or not quote, uh, parentheses, RBES, comma, uh, commercial building energy standards, parentheses, CBES, uh, energy, or, um, yeah, energy codes. So there, there are already these two existing energy codes, and so we might be um, taking some of the pieces from that. Um, moving on, uh, or stretch codes. Inclu I'm just going to keep reading, and I'll just tell you all the edits as we go. Uh, including requirements for time of transfer slash listing, uh, inspection and disclosure slash certification of minimum energy efficiency standards, compliance or non-compliance, and this is new, uh, or anticipated building energy performance uh, using forms generally consistent with the Vermont residential or, though this is new, or commercial uh, building energy standards, and then the rest is the same. Sorry, that was probably not that helpful. I'll send it around <laughs> later. Uh, okay. How would this be applied? Just in general? If this ordinance yep. passed, yep. I mean, uh, this charter change, yep. how would we then go about uh, applying it? So this would give us um, a lot of opportunity to create some ordinances around energy efficiency and in, in enforcement. So the current building energy codes, my understanding is that the, they really only apply to um, uh, new buildings. And so, uh, like, what leverage do we have to, um, particularly in rental housing, uh, get uh, landlords to uh, make energy improvements? And so there are three, there are really three ordinances that this um, uh, anticipates, which is not to say that we have to do them or that, uh, you know, there's any order to these. I mean, and there are probably lots of details that would need to be worked out about any of them. But the three that this is sort of in reference to, um, one is um, uh, uh, the, the part about um, time of transfer or listing. There's a Burlington ordinance that requires that um, any multifamily building uh, must uh, be at a certain energy performance standard at the time of its sale. Um, now, whether it should be at the time of sale or time of listing is, um, uh, you know, w one question. Uh, so in a, in a certain sense, that ordinance has already been done, and it might make some sense for us to, to do that. Um, and the, I believe they also have a, a cap on the amount of money that would be required to be spent on energy improvements so as to not prevent the sale of the building if it was really bad. Um, so that's... You know, but that, those are all details that we could we figure out and learn from, you know, uh, their uh, situation. Uh, so that's that's thing number one. Number two, one of the things that this anticipates is um, uh, something called uh, home energy labeling, which was a proposal back in like 2015 in the Vermont State Legislature. Um, the the best analogy I think for that is that um, like if you're going to go buy a, a car. Uh, you want to know the gas mileage of the car. Why would you not want to also know the um, gas mileage of a house? Mm -hmm. And just like you and I might drive a car differently, um, you have a gas mileage rating based on some um, industry standards. And so beyond just being like, hey, what are your, um, you know, what were your fuel bills? You know, you and I might um, operate a house very differently. And so again, it's important to have that be based on some of the assets of the house. So one hypothesis is that um, the uh, um, well, uh, I forgot that train of thought. We would go with a different train of thought. Um, so one of the uh, things that came out of the 2015 work at the state was that they came up with a, um, a profile that could be provided to um, any potential renters or uh, homeowner or, or uh, home buyers, uh, and they could. Um, so that so they came up with this this profile that would communicate an energy score, um, 
and that uh, they trained a whole bunch of people uh, to give those scores, and so that infrastructure exists, um, but no one is uh, has required that this be uh, done, and so the program, it's while you know, while it's still, it's been sort of mothballed basically at this point, and so um, I, I think of this as mostly like a consumer protection issue, um, as well as being useful in terms of um, energy and energy efficiency. Um, so that's anyway, that's why there's all this reference in here to um, uh, the Vermont Residential uh, Building Energy Standards Certificate. Um, or similar state of Vermont residential bu building energy ratings and labels, because those have already been imagined, if that makes any sense. Yep. Um, so that's the second one. And then the third one um, is uh, captured in the last sentence. So there's this classic problem called the split incentive, uh, which is uh, the issue of how if landlords don't do not include heat in the rent, then they, um, financially speaking, don't necessarily have any reason to do energy improvements on their properties, um, because you know they're not going to see those savings. Um, and then at the same time, the renters don't have the authority to make those energy improvements. So, um, kind of a conundrum. Uh, so one possibility is that in very uh, you know poorly insulated buildings, it's possible that uh, you know we could just say the landlord needs to include heat in the in the rent, and then it basically puts the pain where the problem is, and uh, would be a financial incentive for the landlord to do um, to make improvements. Now, now there's a lot um, that would need to be carefully crafted about that because. Uh, well, there, there's, I could go into that one uh, yeah, no, ad nauseum. That's very, <laughs> but, very, very helpful. Very okay. helpful. And, but that was the kind of list yeah. you were looking for? Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, there are other types of things I can imagine, um, but uh, any of, I, I think, um, because of the way this is framed, um, it allows for other things as well. But it seems to be a carrot and stick, which I appreciate that's what I really wanted to hear yeah that we're trying to upgrade and motivate and incentivize yeah. yeah yeah and just so you know the frame that I'm coming from I um I, there are a lot of carrots out there that um have existed and have worked to some degree um but I think we're at the point where um there, there have been very few sticks uh, around this issue and I I think we're I think we're ready for that um so yeah, and I mean to be fair, we'll base this all on you know what's what's reasonable and easy to um, assess, particularly learning from uh, what Burlington has done. So, um, other I'm sorry, I have a lot to say about this. Clearly, um, other thoughts or comments, uh, Rosie. I have a whole bunch of thoughts, so I'm happy to do them all at once. Or um, so well, let's here. Can I take a, a temperature? Other other people have thoughts. Okay, go ahead. Let's do a few, and then okay. we'll jump around and we'll come back. Um, so I have three main trains of thought here. Um, one is I have a number of concerns about, first, I should say that I appreciate that we're trying to figure out this issue of multifamily units or buildings um, and energy efficiency and rental units. I think that's worth us pursuing, and I, I think there are things that we can do there. I'm concerned about this language specifically. Um, first, in the, the drafting, um, just the way that this is drafted, we don't need to get permission to establish uh, building codes. We already have that. Um, so I think what you're trying to get at is not building codes for new construction. It's, it sounds like you're trying to rate buildings that already exist. Yes. And so I think a, we don't, that, this first line about ordinance establishing, like giving us this power to establish ordinances, establishing min minimum uh, energy codes, we've got that power. And the state has already established these codes for, for the new buildings. So there's no point in us reestablishing the code that the state has adopted. Instead, I think what we're looking for is um, to establish some method of evaluating buildings that are already built. Um, Can I interrupt you? Yeah. Um, uh, so this, I, I did briefly talk about this with some of the energy um, experts and one of the things that came up was the verb uh, um, establishing, like that second word there, mm -hmm. and that that might not be the right word um, because we're we're not 
really literally establishing minimums or right, performance minimums, what we're doing is it's more like um, having a variety of administrations um, or enforcements of those things. Um, so so I, yeah, I think that we don't need to take on the this code piece of it. We, one, already have the power, and two, the states already established the, the energy code. So if we wanted to, without a charter change, we could establish a stricter building code with mm -hmm. regards to energy without getting the, the change. I think what you're wanting to do is to give us some powers to establish penalties or regulations around uh, charging for heat, um, for landlords charging for heat. Mm -hmm. That seems like that's really what... Mm -hmm. um, and to give us some powers uh, around requiring this this labeling um, mm -hmm. for around sales. Um, and I think those were the two things that I heard you talk about. So I'm not sure that um, that that's that the way it's drafted really gets at what we want to do. So I think there's some some room to work there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I also uh, the um, residential energy codes, those really apply to, to new construction. And I think that maybe um, like a HERS score or the, the certificate program that you're talking about would be more appropriate for buildings that already exist. Um, because you can't take an existing Victorian building and say, okay, you have to do this, this, and this thing that are in the energy code for a new building. It, it, what you want to do is get it a, you know, a, a air leakage score and that kind of thing. Um, uh, so that's a different thing that already does exist, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we would want to use instead. And we do in our zoning, we reference HERS already. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I would be probably in favor of using the same one throughout all our mm -hmm. regulations, but that's certainly something we could discuss is that's, which one to use. Yeah, fair enough. I think that's really interesting, and I also feel like that's something that, you know, when we get... Um, so one of the things that I want to do with this language is um, make sure that we're not... Well, to get at what we want to do, but also not um, limit ourselves to something that uh, turns out to not be that useful. So if we, uh, it might make sense to reference hers in here, I guess. Uh, maybe I'm... It might. Am I, 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 yeah. Um, okay. But I, I'm not sure that um, that just talking about the energy code is getting where you want to go there. Okay. For, um, the, for the benefit of people who might not know, <laughs> could could someone say what HERS is? I don't know what HERS stands for, but it is a score um, in terms of energy efficiency that is um, nationally accepted yes, and used. But and it's usually only used for apartments. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it can be used for single family homes. I don't. I don't know well, why it wouldn't be able to. But home um, energy rating system. Oh. Yeah. 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 So that's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> um, and uh, finally, the other thing that I want to, so, so I think we need to get at, are we talking about regulating new buildings versus old buildings? And I yep. think we need different language for each. Okay. So that would be a drafting sure. conversation. No, that's great. Um, the last piece is, while I think that this is worth investigating, I want to be really, really careful about the unintended consequences. And there are some serious public policy consequences of us not t being very thoughtful about this and, and being really considered. Um, one is that, you know, I could see that uh, landlords, rather than going through this process um, to, you know, increase their, their energy efficiency of the building, would just say, well, I'm just going to add $400 to the rent for every month to make sure that I'm covered uh, and I'll pay for the heat, but that'll cover me if the, the tenant cranks their heat up to 80 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, and because Normally, you know, in a, in a normal housing market, they wouldn't be able to do that because there would be other apartments for people to buy, to rent instead. Mm -hmm. But in a very tight housing market, there is probably room for people to increase their rents. And so I just don't want us to do this. And then the result is not increased energy efficiency. It's actually just increased rent. So, so can I address that? Yeah. That is one of the one of my biggest concerns with that last piece. And I my hope is that we would be able to craft it in a way that anticipates that. Um, and particularly uh, limits that effect because it, I think the um, you know has this potential to for there to be a like a spike um, and ultimately cost uh, tenants more. Um, but the anyway, the, knowing that that's a problem, a potential problem ahead of time, um, 
I, I would I would want to be really careful about I agree. Yeah. I guess that's my point. I want to be very careful in crafting, particularly that one. I've got one more point, but Ashley oh. looks like you wanted to chime in on that. Yeah. I, I want to dovetail on that. I, uh, oh, oh, sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> I promise I can be. I can have deference once in a while. It's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so I'm glad that you mentioned that, Rosie. Uh, this is something that I've actually been thinking about for quite some while, and I had reached out to um, the mayor of Barry, Luke Herring, uh, a couple of months ago now. Um, I rented in Burlington when I first moved up here. Um, much to my chagrin, uh, I left pretty quickly. It just wasn't for me, but that's okay, because um, I'm here. So uh, one of the things that I'm very interested in doing, uh, and I think I'm still the only renter on the council, um, I have been through the attempting to find an apartment process and that very scary moment of like, oh my God, I'm going to have no place to live in three weeks if I don't find something right now. Um, and uh, I was surprised at the fact that there are almost zero protections for renters here in Montpelier. Uh, and I, I actually just sent this out to both Ann and Bill. I think I may have sent this out to other folks before, but um, Burlington has uh, a very comprehensive set of ordinances that talk about how and when landlords can raise rent, the percentages at which they are capped at raising rent. There are notice provisions. Uh, there are damage provisions for landlords who violate those terms. So if they raise the rent uh, on 30 days notice, um, the tenant can uh, commence an action in civil court, uh, small claims court most likely, um, and then uh, seek enforcement of the both the ordinance um, through the civil court process, but also uh, can be entitled uh, to financial compensation um, for any losses incurred as a result of a landlord sort of jacking up the rent by $400 a month. Um, so that's something that I've been very interested in. Also, security deposits are another piece of this whole um, conversation when it comes to renting and capping that. Barry actually has it in their charter um, that the security deposit, basically moving into a new apartment, you can't collect more than two months' worth of rent, whether that's apportioned as first and last, first and security, last and security, however it's apportioned, um, it can't be more than two months' rent. So I think it all sort of dovetails. I would also point out, too, that with particular regard to this, um, I don't see energy efficiency just as electricity. I think uh, water as well as, like, um, you know, wastewater and a number of other things sort of fall into that. Wiring and electrical, you know, things can also factor into all of that. Appliances and things like that that are provided. I know there are programs that exist, but I just don't want to focus only on the heat. sort of heat piece, which is a critical piece. But there are a lot more things um, that I think have sort of fallen by the wayside for renters because, uh, well, it's kind of a transient population in part, but also, um, you know, it's not very cheap to live here. And so... I'm, I will confess I have not spent a lot of time thinking about electricity in this context, but I think you're right. It would uh, potentially uh, fit into something like that, and, you know, we could spend well, some especially time. Well, electric, electric heat is a Oh, yeah, with electric heat, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. No, right. great, great. And point. so, in essence, that's another way where the cost gets transferred to the, the tenant, and, mm -hmm. I mean, that is expensive. I've lived in places with electric heat, and that's, like, a 350 to $400 electric bill some months when it's cold, so... Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just wanted to, to finish my thought there. Yep. Um, yep. So that's one major yep. policy concern there. Um, one is, you know, this would have to be kind of more on the extreme end, but if we made our um, requirements too strict, I'm really concerned that we have all this historic housing stock in Montpelier that is going to be difficult to bring up to the same level as new construction. So if we don't allow for that, then... Um, and and that, that housing stock outside of the designated historic district maybe even some houses within it, I can't quite remember how that works, but um, is not protected. Like it, it seems like, oh, you've got this 150 year old house, you can't just tear it down. But if you're not one of those specific houses in the specific area where we do regulate tearing it down or not, um, what is to stop a landlord from tearing it down and replacing mm -hmm. it with a new building? Mm -hmm. And I think if we make it too difficult to own an old building and make it meet our standards, we might see more of that. And so I, I want to caution us that as much as we want to move to net zero, we need to be somewhat aware that the old buildings that we really value for their beauty um, are not ever going to get to 
as good a point as a new building, and we need to figure out how we want to work that in our public policy decisions. Um, and finally, I have one concern about um, making sure that um, in order to sell a building, it has to hit an en energy efficiency standard, um, a multifamily building. Um, I think that that could potentially, you know, if we have a case where there's kind of some, some slumlords who really aren't keeping up their building, that would, why would they want to bother to make those improvements in order to sell the building? They might as well just keep it as it is and keep renting it. And so maybe there's a way to get around that, but I, I, that would be my public policy concern with a, a policy along those lines is that um, you might disincentivize the landlords that you might want to sell their buildings to a new landlord from doing so. Um, mm -hmm. And that would be unfortunate. I agree. All of the things that you just raised. I'm sorry, I have so much to say about this. <laughs> it, it, um, uh, those questions to me have to do with the the dial settings um, of this and like what like you know how much are we capping the improvements at and um, what can our what can our market handle and um, and still make progress and th that's yeah. Your point's well taken. So I would just encourage that, you know, as we go down this road, we really involve landlords and tenants mm -hmm. and all the interested folks in yep. town in this rather than just saying, yeah, let's yep. sit it here. I um, forgot to mention, I did also get to meet with Downstreet earlier this week and went mm -hmm. over this all with them. And they were, um, well, to be fair, they couldn't say that they fully backed it. That would be a board decision for them. But it was, I will say it was well received. <laughs> so that was encouraging. Uh, Glenn. Um, just a couple of things. First, back to Rosie's uh, first comments about the existing codes and so on. Uh, I may be reading it wrong, but it seems to me that if we inserted the word existing in that first sentence so that it reads, ordinance is establishing minergy, minimum energy efficiency standards for existing buildings, that could potentially uh, say more clearly what we mean without yeah. changing it any other way? Yeah, I, I can take that suggestion and, and to just the idea that this is applying to existing buildings back to the lawyer and, you know, re recraft that. And I don't know if that solves all of Rosie's <laughs> issues with it, but but yeah. but <laughs> it, it, it feels like it, it does get closer to what we mean. Yeah. Um, uh, I had a question about one of the, the changes that you uh, talk through. I yep. think it was um, uh, somewhere in there. Uh, um, I think energy ratings and labels, or in no, it was standards compliance or non-compliance, or anticipated performance. Yes. Anticipated by whom is my question there? I um, guess. By um, by the building energy ratings and labels. So, so some of these, uh, like the, uh, so after that comma yeah. right there, it says using forms generally consistent with the Vermont okay. residential, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, okay, so first you label the house and then that gives right. you a sense because of those, the anticipated performance. Those labels, um, like the, the labels and ratings aren't necessarily just about compliance or non-compliance. Right, okay, good. Yep. That answers my question there. Okay. Um, and I wanted to come back to Rosie's last point, too, about calling in a uh, conversation with renters and landlords and, and other people. And I think that I know a few landlords who are uh, com come at it from being builders, uh, and a lot of their uh, MO is to take old existing buildings and uh, really improve them as much as they can and then rent them. And I think that uh, we want to encourage that as much as possible um, and make it easier for them to do it. Uh, and so I think those might be the, the, the people to, to focus on and check and see where our, where our dials are. So I would love to connect you to some, some of those people. Super. Um, and then also I just want to call back to the first thing you talked about, the Efficiency Vermont Concierge Service, mm -hmm. which sounds great uh, and sounds like a really good carrot um, to be able to, as I understand it, any property owner can 
Yep. Basically, starting in January. Well, I'm not Hopefully sure what the date is yet that we're going to start it, point, but yeah. Starting soon. at some point soon. <laughs> yeah, January. Can, can get Efficiency Vermont to, mm. to give them a bunch of information about how they could improve. That's right. great. I think this whole thing is uh, something that I support. Awesome. Jack. <sighs> well, this, the, the whole idea of uh, making uh, the buildings of our city more energy efficient is, is very important. And we've been having a lot of discussion about uh, er everything that people have said tonight has just emphasized or has, has made me think more about how complicated this whole thing is. And uh, some of the, comp I, th and I think it's fair to say that some of the complications are more related to what the language of implementing ordinances would be than the charter language itself. But on the other hand, I do think it's also important to have a, a good sense of where we want to be going before we adopt charter language that, uh, so that we know that it's, uh, it's well crafted to get us where we're going. Um, I had a good uh, long conversation with the mayor about this last night and I don't want to feel like I'm backing down from what I said, but I think that this might be a longer conversation than we put this together and have worn a couple of public hearings in January and, uh, and then go to uh, the ballot on town meeting day, because I think it might be, there might be more to it than that. Um, and I can envision, for instance, asking both the housing task force and the uh, energy committee to, uh, to look at this. Um, Ashley was talking about a whole lot of uh, tenants' rights uh, issues, and I know that uh, next month uh, one of our meetings has to do with uh, rental, uh, rental housing standards. Um, and so there's a lot there. I was looking at this, at the uh, source uh, material in Title 30 of the Vermont statutes, which seems to already have a requirement that new, cons new residential construction be built uh, meeting these standards. And I don't know if they are or not, or who's enforcing it. But not the stretch code. Okay. We could do that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, and then but, how are we going to enforce that? Uh, but I, I'd like to understand a little more about how all that works. Um, I, I think that some of the things we see in the uh, in the rental housing market now, in, even in Montpelier, is really pretty troubling. You know, and I go, I've been in a lot of uh, uh, units and. My colleagues at Legal Aid have been in a lot of units where landlords have decided the the easiest way to address uh, heating problems is to put uh, put a Renai heating heater in one of the uh, one of the rooms in an apartment and and call that good and say well okay now I'm offloading the heating bill onto the tenant and it probably doesn't meet the code because it probably is not the, the one uh, heater in one end of the apartment probably is not sufficient to uh, bring the, uh, the temperature to the uh, standard required by the rental housing health code and all the other rooms in, in the apartment. So I, I think there's a lot for us to work on that I think we should work on. Sorry, did you? But, sorry. So um, in terms of understanding more, um, would it be useful to have people hear from Efficiency Vermont or from, like I'm trying to think of like, uh, I mean, you mentioned some of our committees. I mean, the Energy Committee is looking at it now. Um, so they'll have um, time to comment. Um, 
soon. I mean, we, we talked about it. We've actually been talking about it for the last couple of meetings. And um, anyway, so uh, trying to, I'm trying to boil down what you were saying into, like, w- what are some next steps for you? Yes, I do think having, uh, having some energy experts, energy and construction experts into uh, talk to us about how this would work okay. is a valuable thing. Um, and the EIC in their operation of efficiency Vermont is right up at, up at the top in, in my view. Um, so yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Rosie then Ashley. I think Donna was actually. Oh, oh. okay. Um, so Rosie, Ashley, so Donna. I, I would echo <laughs> Jack's wanting to slow this down a little bit. I think that we are gonna, I, I would like us to craft the ordinances that we want to do um, at least in, in part before we craft the charter change that we need um, because I think that we have much more likelihood of explaining to the public what we <coughs> want to do with this and to explaining to the legislature what we want to do with this and you know we have seen before that when we're too vague with our charter changes the legislature is not particularly excited about embracing them and so I think if we can point to this is exactly what we're planning to do we'll have a much it may seem like it'll take longer up front, but actually we'll have a much more higher likelihood of success um, if we spend the time to figure all this stuff that, that Jack's talking about out up front. Um, so that would be my next steps preference is to kind of do more delving into figuring out what do we actually want to do, start crafting those ordinance changes, and then work on the charter change to meet those needs. Ashley. Um, one thing, that just as, sort of as Jack was speaking, that sort of stood out to me um, in thinking about this proposal is that this is pretty verbose. Like this is this is a lot of specificity in um, a document that does require a degree of specificity, but does not seem to entail in any other place this level of specificity. And so I'm wondering. So I, I sort of see this as a as a two prong thing. One. We, are, we want, or the council is considering requesting um, the opportunity to present this to the voters, to vote on whether or not the voters believe that the city should um, have the uh, option to, in essence, regulate by creating ordinances. Um, uh, you know, minimum energy efficiency standards for buildings in our community. So that's sort of one piece. And then the second piece, I think, is a bigger policy, like ordinance drafting question about how we would go about doing that. And um, it feels like uh, this is so so I think what at least to me, what what I'm hearing and and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, Jack and Rosie, because I think the two of you sort of highlighted that piece, which is like, how do we go about effectuating these these potential policy changes? versus how do we even inquire whether the legislature is willing to give us, if the voters give us the authority to, to make that request. Um, to me, that's, that's the sort of question here. And so, um, you know, n- not weighing in on my thoughts about, you know, some of the particular policy proposals contained herein, I think it's sort of a, a basal question of, um, you know, do, you know, adding to the city charter the ability for the council to regulate these things rather than proscribing or prescribing particular options for that. So I'm wondering if there was one, any particular reason that we ended up with all of these yes. law talking words on the page. Yes. Okay. And so can I ask what that is? Yep. So uh, it was our lawyer's opinion that okay. uh, having um, very specific um, references like so the the ordinances that this anticipates are sort of all built in here Mm -hmm. um and that's why it ended up being so verbose so one of the um one of the concerns that that he had right was he wants to give this its best chance at passing and he thought that um having sort of specific references to um existing codes to um uh, you know the energy labeling work that's already been done um, that that um, would help its passage um, 
That sounds like a totally lawyer thing to say, and I say that as a lawyer. That's fair. Um, but I, I also feel like sometimes lawyers tend to eat their own in that regard. Like, we get so wrapped up in, like, what the, you know, the, what it ought to be. Um, and, and, you know, and so I'm sort of looking at this, right? Like, so can, uh, I'm not really clear how this whole thing is, like, numbered or, or sectioned off either because it seems to change formatting. Like, so we've got 5-301A, B, and then we go 1, 2, and then A, B, C, D. So, but looking at, um, uh, let's see, construction of improvements, including curbs, sidewalks, lighting, and storm drains, yada, 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 yada. Um, you know, there are other standards that we have to adhere to, like there are state standards that we have to adhere to in terms of width and height and things like that, um, but it's not spelled out that we have to do that. Um, and so it just seems like maybe we could cut out some of those words such that we still get at the crux of the issue, which is utilizing those already existing tools um, but taking out the sort of policy judgment or, you know, policy value piece of this, you know, in terms of referencing that uh, as it relates to rental property, such minimum energy efficiency standards may require, blah, blah. Um, you know, sort of taking that piece out because I don't know. So I sort of view this as like the Constitution, right? Like it's sort of this like thing that's left to interpretation. Um, and so then that would would give the voters some, you know, we, we would be having these conversations at the public hearings, what are, you know, what what kinds of ordinances could we draft, um, but it would be leaving those bigger, more significant policy questions about how we effectuate these things to um, to the council to have in a thoughtful way like we did with the zoning. An interesting question. I mean, I, so, so uh, my only hesitation there is, as a non-lawyer, um, you know, part of me wants to believe our lawyer, <laughs> right? To say that, like, well, you know, if that's if, other lawyers too. Yeah, I suppose that's true. We do have other lawyers. All with different opinions. Anyway, um, your point's well taken, though. Um, uh, before we go to Donna, um, <laughs> poor Donna. It's okay. I'll get. Actually, you know what? I I can I can hold my thought. Go ahead. <laughs> that's okay. Well, you started out, I thought, trying to get a measurement of where we were with yeah. this ordinance versus fine-tuning it. And some of the fine-tuning it has given us an understanding. I'd like us to move ahead with the intention of doing the charter change and that we have to come up with some language that we have public hearings on and we keep working on it. But that there's no way we can do everything, Rosie, that you want us to do before this gets posted. But meanwhile, between when we have to have the ordinance language and then we can work out the policy between then and town meeting as we share with the public what we're about. That's what I would like us to have as a vision. Great, thank you, awesome, Connor. Donna said a lot of what I was going to say, I think. Um, a lot of what people have mentioned does scare the hell out of me as well. Um, and I, I think we need to have our eyes wide open uh, and look at those red flags as we move forward. At the same time, you know, pushing this back to a November special election, I think, puts us beyond this biennium and into the next one. Uh, so I think we can, to some extent, work on parallel tracks with drafting those ordinances at the same time as moving forward with the intent on this one. I have my own concerns. I, I don't think our city staff can absorb uh, all these functions as they are now, so we'd have to look at an appropriation for next year. So we've got a lot of work to do, but I think if we could, and I am looking at the other ones, they are written in more plain English than this one. Yeah. Um, and if you go to the Government Operations Committee, they're citizen legislators like us, and they might actually appreciate the simplicity <laughs> of it uh, and not, not bogged down with the legal stuff. So. Yeah, if you're taking the temperature, I'd be okay, okay. moving forward in the, in the broader okay. sense. Glenn, did you have something you wanted to add? Um, thank you. And I also just want to add, um, uh, thankfully, the, so there's, this anticipates three ordinances, right? So one of them, we already can um, work from Burlington's ordinance. Well, let, let me back up. When we were going to be um, thinking about banning plastics, or plastic bags, really, um, the anticipated ordinance was the same one that Brattleboro has. Um, so using models uh, should be very useful to us. Um, one, the, the first one, it's very similar. I, I would imagine doing something to um, similar to what Burlington has. So that should help. Um, two, the home energy labeling has actually been adopted by, uh, I'm going to get it wrong, it's um, 
it's either Seattle or Portland. It's uh, Oregon. One, it's one of those two. And anyway, so I, and I've actually been on conference calls with them talking about how it was implemented. So forgive me, I, I feel like I've done a lot of background <laughs> work on this so it, that has not necessarily included you all. And so, um, you know, happy to uh, continue to share more. And uh, anyway, but my point is that there exists an ordinance um, that's being enforced right right now about home energy labeling. Um, the one that is probably novel novel is the one regarding the split incentive, and we can I, I think that's something that we um, could be spending some time with. Um, I saw Ros Rosie and then uh, Ashley. So I guess I would clarify that I agree with Donna that's a lot of work and I was not anticipating that we would be able to get it done by March and this is such a big thing. This is this is as big as zoning in terms of the impact that it has on our property landscape in Montpelier and so I would like us to take the time and get it right and I think that looking at our schedule we don't have that time before town meeting day and so I would be more inclined to do this right and do it you know, um, with a November type timeline for the actual charter change. Um, but as we work towards the charter change, we're also working on what those ordinance changes would be, again, to give the public a better sense of what we're looking at and to give ourselves that sense of what we want to do. Um, and then once we have that, that language approved, then it's, it's a better package to present to the legislature um, and we're, we're in place to go from there. Um, the next thing I wanted to say is that I believe if you want to adopt the stretch code for exist or for new buildings, we can do that without this. And so that might be something that we go ahead and start thinking about. I, I want to think about that more about whether we actually want to do it, but that's something that we could discuss apart from a, a charter change mm -hmm. timeline. And those stretch codes would be setting different types of standards that would trigger some of these different enforcements. No, it would um, as, uh, adopting this the Vermont Energy Stretch Code, and I don't have the quite, but the stretch um, code, yeah. for new construction in Montpelier would just be a building code that we would adopt, and we can. I think we did adopt it, but we didn't require. No, no, the state has adopted it, but not required. So it. I, I think and we I have it in our. It is referenced in our, uh, in our zoning. I, I think. think it may be a, if you hit the stretch code, you can do X, Y, or Z, but I yeah. don't believe that we've required it, and I'm saying that that's something that we could decide we could, yeah. to do without a charter change. Fair. Uh, Ashley. So I'm just, I've just been sort of wordsmithing just stream of consciousness, and so I guess what, maybe I'm not understanding something. So. I hear that we want to, or we are interested, or you are taking the temperature of whether the council has the appetite to put this on the town meeting day ballot. Is that? Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. I'm with you. So next question. When is the expectation that the ordinances that people are envisioning or not envisioning, whichever, uh, would happen. I would imagine that this would be, a, all three of those things would be a lot for the community to absorb. So I wouldn't want to implement those all at once or even close to each other. Hold on, I'm not understanding. So we can't, I mean, we wouldn't even have the authority to enforce those ordinances without a charter change. Right. So... Why wouldn't we have the vote on just the charter change and then see what the legislature does and have committees working on that while that's percolating over at the state house? Because you mean committees working on the ordinances? Correct. Uh, yeah. I just yeah. I, so so to me that seems to be the the sort of the way to approach this. Have a general request that I'm not super familiar with these terms, but something like um, D would say, enact ordinances establishing and enforcing minimum efficiency standards for commercial and residential properties in the city in accordance with state, federal, and other, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, other like uh, adopted, Oops. mandated something. Standards. Standards, whatever. Um, and, and leave it at that. And then therefore that gives the city some idea as to whether or not the legislature is even going to allow the city to do that 
by approving or denying the request to change the charter, assuming the voters approve it. Then the committee or committees, because I could see a few, sort of would, would be working on putting these ordinance proposals together because I do think there are a lot of moving parts to that. Um, but it, it just seems like, one, we're unnecessarily limiting ourselves because what I don't want to do is in 10 years when these standards change and we're referencing in our city charter, which is our governing document, you know, things that are outdated. It's like prohibition in the Constitution, right? Terrible idea. You should never put that in the Constitution as an amendment. Um, you know, but, but what ultimately did happen is there were other ways to enforce that, that, that desire, um, and they did it through other means like you know highway funding um so it just seems to me like maybe a more generalized sort of very short mirroring some of the surrounding provisions would would make the most sense and then you know if there are guidance or or wishes for ordinances that we address those separately from any request to amend the charter so i have lots of thoughts on that um so one is that I think that to me that highlights the need to have the first clause be right. Mm -hmm. um, because everything after the which may incorporate um, is like, here are things that we, we just don't want you to be surprised if we start to do these things, right? So it's just, I mean, the, the I know our lawyer's advice is really about um, trying to make it abundantly clear um, that these are the kinds of things that we're anticipating uh, doing uh, based on this amendment. Mm -hmm. That um, strikes me as, as, a, as the conversation to have with the legislature and the conversation that we have as a council rather than like putting that into the charter. Couldn't say something like ordinances establishing mini, 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 minimum energy efficiency standards for existing and new buildings, which may include um, and then just list boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Which is what, and I mean, and that doesn't all this, all the, the other stuff. No, that's it's fair. Good, I mean, it's such as, you know, um, energy efficiency standards, keep home energy labeling, home energy labeling the, those kind of things and just leave it. At right. That. The point is it doesn't obligate us to do those things. It's just, the authority. yeah. And I think the authority of that, that what, whatever's given in that first clause should be general enough so that we can um, do other things as well. Does that make any sense, Ashley? Um, it, it does. I just, and maybe this is like my own lawyerly mind thinking, like I, well, one, the council is still going to be the gatekeeper mm -hmm. of this function anyway. So any ordinance, if the legislature grants a charter change, which is, I think is maybe a, a much larger hurdle than than any of us are contemplating in this conversation, but setting that aside, um, it just doesn't seem to me that that we would would need to build all of that into this. Because what if they change mm -hmm. the name in a year, and then people are reading our city charter, and then we have to petition for another charter change mm -hmm. to amend, even though it's just a technical amendment. It's, there's still a process by which that all has to, you know, go through, and that just doesn't that doesn't seem like the most most best use of, of city, um, you know, city attention and council resources. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, Donna, do you have something? Well, j just that I think we do have to do some of the ordinances, as Rosie and uh, Jack were pointing out, along the way so that our citizens understand what our thinking is, and it helps us to see the potholes as well as the benefits even though I do think you're, that we should go ahead with the, or, the charter change language and put it forth. But meanwhile, we should be working on the other stuff, I think. Good. Jack. Um, I've, I'm on record in this, in previous council meetings already as saying that, as a lawyer, is saying that people should generally follow the advice of their attorney. <laughs> 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 um, one, one of the, uh, one of the, thoughts that I have in uh, anticipating how this is going to go, for one thing, I don't think this is going to be harder to get through the legislature than we think it is, because I already think it's going to be really hard to get it through the legislature. <laughs> um, but, but getting beyond that, um, I can just anticipate 
some property owner who doesn't like the way this affects him or her deciding to sue the city and one of the things they'll say is well this ordinance goes beyond what uh, the legislature gave you authority to do and so that's one of the things that we want to think through pretty carefully as we're, as we're crafting the uh, the charter ordinance yeah agreed the charter amendment I should say all right, so uh, thank you all. This is great feedback. I'm going to take all this feedback and um, consult with some more energy folks and the lawyer again. And, um, and some landlords. Uh, yes, and some landlords. Actually, they're on my schedule. And as, as well as actually um, Capstone, um, who does weatherization work. Um, they're maybe, also on my list. Maybe somebody from Burlington. Uh, been, yep, so they've, we've been also in touch. Uh, uh, about all of this as well but yeah so um but yeah checking in with all those folks i think will be good so i'll have something um more or different for you for next time can we have a break yes and then it'll be time for the mdc okay great thank you uh so we're back from break go ahead can we leave the lights on okay great okay new projector let me know if something doesn't show up right, and I can either explain any of the graphs. Um, so my name is Laura Gephardt. I'm the executive director for the Montpelier Development Corporation. Um, so I'm here tonight to give our six-month update. Um, and that is part of the agreement that one is in the Economic Development Strategic Plan, but it's also in our Memorandum of Understanding with the city. Um, I have six-month-ish because the last time we gave an update was in September of last year. Um, and so with a, some turnover with the executive directors, I am now taking that over. Um, I came on in May, uh, so we hope to make it six months from here on out. So tonight I'll give an economic development overview um, and just kind of a, a general overview about economic development um, because I realized um, Anne and Donna were really the only two that were on council when the EDSP was adopted. Um, so we just wanted to frame that a little bit for everyone. Um, also go over the 2018 economic development activity that happened in the city and then looking forward uh, the priorities for the Montpelier Development Corporation. Oops. So here um, is MDC's vision and our mission um, and this is couched in uh, the economic development strategic plan. Um, but we are a private nonprofit that was created um, out of a recommendation from the Economic Development Strategic Plan um, to implement the plan um, and act in coordination with the city, but to act independently. So I see economic development as a forest, really, and I love to make the comparison in this way. Uh, and in a forest, you have the plants, you have the trees, um, and I equate these to businesses, so our organizations, uh, for-profit, non-profit, educational institutions. Um, in order for them to grow, uh, you need to have the adequate soil, rain, air quality for them to prosper. So I see economic development as providing an environment where these organizations can grow and be successful. Um, I also uh, like this um, chart, I guess, a graph um, that I'll walk through just because it, it gets to economic development isn't just working with businesses. Um, we touch all points of, of the community because economic development is the prosperity of businesses, but it's also improving quality of life of a community. So at the top, we have healthy environment, vibrant places, housing options, healthy people, quality education, arts and culture, equity. Those all work to attract, retain, and support a talented workforce um, and high quality organizations. Um, and those in turn increase our regional income and opportunities, public revenues, which we then get to invest back into those pieces at the top. Um, to put in a little perspective, MDC, uh, where we kind of work within this uh, cycle, uh, we create and support development that you know, influences these uh, vibrant places and housing options. And we work with our partners to address um, some of these other aspects. Uh, we don't have the expertise to, to address certain things in the community, such as homelessness, but that's a really important aspect that we need to be considering um, in the grand scheme of things. 
And then uh, the majority of our, our work is actually working with businesses to support them in their growth, to provide more job opportunities, to attract and retain talent, um, and to spark entrepreneurship and, and startups. So kind of uh, where I see Montpelier in this process, uh, before I came and uh, long before the EDSP was adopted, there was some activity to start looking at economic development a bit more intentionally. Um, so at the start of this, we have the EDSP that was adopted, MDC was created, and then in this phase, uh, which I consider the phase where the EDSP is being implemented, uh, we have this first part which is already underway where we're seeing some significant private investment um, over the past year, and we've had commitments for public infrastructure improvements um, and other investments. And to continue this uh, progress, we need to continue to have targeted economic development activity um, and public-private coordination and investment to continue moving the needle on improving quality of life and the, the viability of Montpelier. So the idea is that all these activities eventually lead to the outcomes that we want, uh, which in the EDSP is outlined as an increase in private sector jobs and establishments, housing, and increase in population. So here are the metrics that are outlined by the EDSP. Um, and again, it's saying that we work on these various strategies and our outcome will be an increase in these various areas. So by 2021, it has uh, these various goals outlined. Um, and so I took some data and looked at our progress as of 2017. So this is assuming that our baseline is 2016 um, and this is we're going only to 2017 just because that is the last full data set for all six of these metrics. Um, some of these are updated quarterly um, and the sources of these, uh, this data is um, in the report that he distributed as well. So where we are um, as of 2017, we actually had a decrease in private sector jobs, uh, but we had an increase in new establishments. Um, and I wanted to put a graph in here uh, just to show that it's, it's really hard to get perspective over one year. Um, so to break that out a little bit more to look that at, we've had a relatively steady growth in our number of establishments um, and we had some volatility in the number of private sector jobs. Um, so we had a spike in 2015 and we've started to, a slight decline. Um, I have a few theories about this, I don't have to get into them now, but um, again it helps um, to look at some of this data over a, a greater amount of time. Uh, but getting back to uh, these metrics, uh, as of 2017, and this is based off the American Community Survey, we had a decrease in residents. We did have 73 housing units approved for construction um, in 2017. And then we had an increase in our meals receipts um, and a decrease in our rooms receipts. Um, and just to put into context how those translate, um, in 2017, we had $26 million total of meals receipts and $3.7 million total for rooms receipts. Um, so here's that same data, just in a chart form. Um, so going back quickly, the line along the bottom is our 2016 baseline. The dotted line at the top um, shows that if each of these metrics get to their 100% goal, it would get up to that, that dotted line. So this is where we're at as of 2017. Um, and as you can see, some of those are below the baseline. Um, so we have some work to do um, to reflect some of the activity that has been going on in 2018. Um, there's some assumptions we can make um, that adding on to those bars, here's what it may look like in the next year when we touch back into this data. Um, I don't have residents or meals and rooms receipts um, on there, but we are able to uh, predict a little bit in terms of private sector jobs, establishments, and housing units. Okay. Uh, is that net new establishments? It is, yes. Yep, so that's considering closures as well. Do you define an establishment? Is that bricks and mortar, or if I start an LLC with a couple people in town? It's, does that count as well? Um, that's a great question. I'd actually have to look. Um, this is based off of the quarterly um, from the Department of Labor there blanking on the name for it, but employment and wages. So if you have an employee, you're considered a firm or an establishment, gotcha. basically. Yeah. Any other questions with this? When you look at data like um, the rooms receipts, for example, do you also correlate that with the number of available rooms? Like, for example, I mean, it probably wouldn't have affected this data, but like 
Betsy's bread and breakfast is closed mm -hmm. and others. And so, you know, it, it, does that necessarily mean less people are coming or that there's less places to stay? And I don't know it's, how Airbnb fix it to that too. So. Right. And so that's hard to, that's a little hard to determine. So there's a few different variables in that data. It may be fewer people are coming, but it also, it also captures any closures. So Betsy's B and B going to uh, closing is something that would impact that data. Um, and I there's some data too that I have that shows this over a few years. Um, so it's interesting. I'm not quite sure what's contributing to that 8.3 percent decrease. But here's another area that when Hampton Inn and Suites comes online, we we can assume that we're going to see an increase here as well. So to bring some color to the dark green on those bars, um, some of the activity that's happened in 2018, some of our major projects, uh, the creation of a tax increment financing district, uh, which is essential for um, provi providing a space for future private investment and also public infrastructure improvements. We had a first bond approved, obviously the public parking garage, the French block apartments are, are near completion in their construction, which will add 18 housing units through the core downtown. One Taylor Street Transit Center and housing is under construction, also adding housing to the downtown. Hampton Inn and Suites and public parking garage um, were issued a decision at least at this point, um, and Calgary Spirits Distillery is currently under construction. And here's a little bit more activity, uh, just some business openings and expansions that have either been completed or have been announced. Um, I listed some of the closures. Uh, this isn't all-encompassing. There's a likelihood I've missed some, um, but it's still an impressive list of what has occurred in the last year. So getting to um, MDC's specific activity. Um, so again, I came in in May, um, and a big piece of uh, what I wanted to do at the outset was start building relationships and getting out, meeting people, and understanding um, where our, who our partners are, how we can collaborate together, um, and also meeting with businesses uh, to understand what their needs are um, and what may, opportunities may lie out there. So in the past few months, it's been over 200 meetings with partners, resource providers, businesses, and property owners. We worked on 12 business retention and expansion projects, um, and these 12 we've actively participated in. So providing resources or connecting uh, businesses to other resources, um, we also implemented some software to be able to track some of these at this activity that in the future I can translate this activity into jobs retained, jobs added, um, and an actual investment into the community. Um, with the parking garage project, we provide support um, predominantly in communication and outreach to the public and spreading information and, into, and to stakeholders. Um, in regional collaboration, um, we had a, an opportunity to work with our neighboring communities, Barry and Waterbury, as well as the Central Vermont Chamber and Economic Development Corporation uh, to host the Central Vermont Fresh Tracks Road pitch in August, um, which was a, just a great way to kind of cross that imaginary and non-imaginary border to the other communities um, and start to, to conceptualize some concepts regionally. Um, and the two young women featured in that photo, one at the Central Vermont uh, pitch stop um, from SheFly, and they went on, um, I had the opportunity to coach them in their pitch in Burlington as well, um, in their phenomenal group. So heading into 2019, um, over the past couple months, um, the MDC board has gone through two facilitated discussions to start to envision what are our priorities heading into the next year. So this is considering what does the EDSP lay out, um, what are our current opportunities, um, and what have we learned um, over the past year and a half of our existence. Um, so from that, we were able to garner our priority areas. Um, I'm still working on coming up with a fixed work plan, which I'm happy to share with all of you, um, that starts to prioritize the activities under those priority areas um, and figuring out where we can best allocate our resources um, over the next year, and also thinking about the long term. Um, and part of that was understanding the key opportunities and threats that currently exist or that we can foresee. Um, and I see key opportunities is really with our business community. We have some really phenomenal groups, um, but we're not tapping into them as much as I would like to. Um, so understanding their growth plans and how we can facilitate that 
um, among other areas. Um, it's a really good opportunity. We're very uh, lucky and fortunate to have a pretty diverse mix of industries. Um, some key threats, you know, it remains to be a threat that we have such a low vacancy rate both in our housing and our commercial areas. Um, so to put in context, commercial vacancy rate for retail is considered healthy at between 5 and 10%, and we're currently sitting below 3%. Um, so that just creates some challenges when we either, we're either trying to facilitate growth with existing re retailers, or we have a displacement like we did, we're going to have with the Shippey Eye Care um, expansion, and we can't accommodate a change of space. Um, so that, along with housing and increasing our housing stock, um, are key threats that we want to be able to keep in our sights over the next year. So quickly bringing it back to the EDSP building blocks. These are the four strategies that are laid out in the Economic Development Strategic Plan, again with the idea that if we um, put our attention and resources into these areas, we will start to move the needle on those metrics. So keeping, in that, keeping that in mind, we've um, evolved the structure a little bit in the framework um, that our mission is at the top to ensure the long-term viability of Montpelier. And underneath that is our uh, customer groups. So the people that I and the MDC serves directly, there's existing organizations, new organizations, and developers. Um, it doesn't include on this graphic all of our stakeholders and partners that we work with in this, um, which obviously includes the city, Montpelier Live, other resource <coughs> providers, both at the local, regional, and state level. Um, and so underneath that are our priorities that uh, we see as essential to cultivating an environment where these three customer groups can be successful and contribute to the, can contribute to the overall well-being of the community. Um, and just bring it back um, that this isn't lost. We um, pr are promoting growth, but it's growth in line with community values. So it's not growth at, at all cost. It's measured and it's making sure that's in line with what is appropriate for the community. Um, so going into the 2019 priorities, uh, just quickly, the business retention and expansion plan program, um, this is economic development jargon, but basically it's just a formalized approach to connecting and maintaining re relationships with the business community. Um, it allows us to understand their needs and be reactive to any opportunistic growth op growth pro projects or retention projects. So if you know they're on the verge of shutting down, we can be a little bit more proactive with that and at least have that connection. It also informs um, us about the economy. So we take that information back and are able to have a better understanding of what's going on. Um, and it also helps us to inform our strategies, the services we provide, and inform other people's strategies, policies, programs. Uh, development project management um, is the MDC was essentially set up to be acting in part as the development arm for the city. So now that we're staffed and we're functioning, um, we see us championing that in the next year and being able to act in, a, in a, an active role going forward. Um, outreach and communication, while we spend a lot of time with the businesses, uh, we want to be really focused on our um, engagement with the community because essentially we need to be in tune with them and understand the community values to uh, feed back into the business community as well. So it's a two-way street and we want the community engaged in economic development decisions as well. Um, and the last bucket is informed development planning and strategy. Um, and this is uh, us wanting to establish MDC as the go-to resource for economic development, anything in Montpelier. And so us being able to take our expertise and the information that we garner from our connections to inform city policies, city programs, um, as well as other resource providers, partners in their plans and strategies, and really looking at the long term. So looking ahead, um, in future updates to the council, uh, we plan to give a progress report basically on our work plan, where are we at, um, at the six month mark in terms of what we wanted to implement, um, including our project activity and the outputs in terms of jobs and, and investment, um, and then the community indicators and trends. Uh, so 
we know Mir Watson is putting together the community indicators. MDC will be overseeing a few of those and responsible be responsible for reporting those. Um, so I would love to be able to do some, you know, small a bit of analysis to inform you all about what our economy actually looks like and what do some of the numbers actually mean. And that's all I have for you guys today. <laughs> kind of open it up to questions, comments. Um, Ashley. Uh, so I, I did some digging while you were presenting, and it looks like at least the best read I can get is that the Department of Labor um, breaks it down into a, a categories by the number of employees, but they do count four or fewer workers. So it would seem like an LLC that generates revenue would count as long mm -hmm. as there's some person like generating revenue for an administration yeah um, so in terms of you had uh, a graph about the uh, number of jobs decreasing but the number of establishments increasing am I right about that yes. the last chart. Yeah. oh sorry employment this guy? that one yep yes so is, do we have any data about what the wages are for those new jobs or what the average wage is for those new jobs? It's gonna, it would be hard to extrapolate what the new jobs, what mm -hmm. the wages of the new jobs are. Mm -hmm. um, I can always reach out to the Department of Labor and see how we could crunch some of that. Mm -hmm. There are, uh, they have an ongoing average wages. Um, so you can track that over time along with number of establishments, number of employees. Um, and it's hard to correlate those, but it would help inform that. Well, and just in looking at the new business or the you know the new establishments list, a lot of them seem like service sector, you know, mm -hmm. food service or um, or other markets that are service based. Um, and I, I was just curious in terms of you know what what's the average like statewide, maybe even mm -hmm. what you know what jobs uh, in those sectors typically pay. And then in the bigger conversation about housing, you know, are the jobs that Montpelier is creating enough to actually sustain a lifestyle in Montpelier? Yeah, and I, I would love to um, jump off that a little bit um, with the activity that was mentioned. Um, most of them retailers, restaurants, those are the most visible. And those are, that's one of the most, I'd say, volatile uh, industries. Um, and so we can point to them and say they've opened this year or, you know, but it's not going to hit headlines that, you know, one of our insurance companies added 20 jobs. Mm -hmm. But that's, some of that data is captured in this, but it's hard to, it's hard to capture that and show and say, you know, this is a big announcement, we've added something here. Um, but I'd be happy to uh, share a breakdown too of where we've added jobs so because some of it's been in the finance and insurance sector, some of it's been in, in the retail, so. Sure, and do you happen to know also, so that the number of um, employees has decreased, uh, do you have information about where those jobs have been shed and if any of them have been like reapportioned in other sectors or anything like that. Yeah, so the Department of Labor does break it down by industry, okay. um, so we can start to dive into that a little bit more of okay. where are we losing, where are we gaining. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I noticed in your report there's a mention of an RFP for the Court Street block, and I think there was some other project that was mentioned, and I wondered if there was anything more that you could say. Main Street. Main Street, uh, mm. 12 to 16 Main Street. Okay. Um, say, I don't know much about what those two are, and so yeah. if you want to. <laughs> sure. So 12 to 16 Main Street, um, that would probably better fall under the category of informing development and planning strategy, or whatever that bucket was. Um, but that's the former Moat property. Oh, okay. Yep, and so that's, can we be, can we weigh in with, you know, what our perspective and expertise in, that, in something like that as you all um, consider the next uses for it. And then the Court Street block. Court Street pit. So, oh, yeah. and that's more generally, can we start to think about our underutilized sites and how do we make them, uh, use them for higher and better uses? Um, so thinking big, how do we, how do we think about that block? Great. Yeah. Um, and then um, 
I noted that it looks like maybe we pushed tax stabilization policy back. She didn't. We did? I did. I, so I won't be here on the 9th, and I would love to be part of that. So I might request that maybe that gets Copy bumped a little bit more. <laughs> um, it's a critical conversation, um, and I we need to do it. Um, but I also would like to be here for it if we can, <laughs> if others would accommodate. Yes. yes. Um, and then I also just wanted to make a general comment that um, I know MDC has gone through this transition, um, and so it's hard to hold you accountable for a year of output when you've been here for six months. And um, I do want the council to generally be cognizant of in future years, you know, we are investing $100,000 per year in this and making sure that we are getting $100,000 worth from this and that we shouldn't take that money and do something else with it that would maybe help businesses or, or economic development more. Um, so I don't feel that it's really fair to hold you to that standard this year, um, but I want to make sure that we're remembering to not just assume, okay, we're going to do $100,000 here every year to really evaluate that each year and hold it to a, that, you know, is this worth spending money on standard? So, yeah. And I appreciate that. I just want to note and applaud the council that economic development is a long term investment. And so it is hard to, re to show any sort of real return in a few years. Um, so it takes a little bit of trust as well. But I, I totally appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Glenn, did you have something? And then Donna. Um, first, I just want to say I think this is a really good presentation. And I uh, am learning tons of stuff. So thank you. And I, it seems to me that you're, you're doing a great job. Uh, and also, I think I want to say, um, as a relatively new counselor, and as uh, a counselor who was not involved in uh, formulating the EDSP and so on, mm -hmm. um, I have some some kind of queasiness about a lot of the base assumptions and ideas. Uh, and while I really do like the specific directions that you've been going in in a lot of ways, and and um, and a lot of the particulars. Um, I feel like I should maybe just warn you <laughs> that that uh, that there are some things that that give me a little bit of pause. So, for example, um, I liked your how you let off with the forest analogy, mm -hmm. um, and just when I see that, I think yes, forests grow and individual plants grow, and then they also die, um, and there's there's a, a curve and a down and while, and, and I think that that's a useful part of that analogy to apply to human societies and, and human organizations that um, we do want to make it, uh, we, we want to make Montpelier viable for the long term, but that does not necessarily mean to me growing. Maybe not at all mm -hmm. at some point. I think that, that uh, right now there are definitely some, some things that I want to grow but there are also some that, that I might not. Um, and kind of in the same direction, uh, I thought that it was interesting to, to that, that we identified the, the MDC's customer groups, uh, existing businesses, new, new businesses and developers, mm -hmm. and that's good. Uh, and at the same time, What's good for businesses is very often good for people, but not always perfectly. And uh, I guess I want to be sure that, I mean, as you said in there, and I really appreciated that as well, growth and development in line with community values and, and, and making sure that it, it all uh, goes along with that. And then I guess a, a specific question, and it's just my ignorance, um, what is the MDC's funding structure? We, the city gives $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Are there other funding sources? What are they? Not right now. And that's what we're, and we realize that too. Um, and so it's understanding too where are there other opportunities for us to diversify because I don't think, we all understand that it's not fair for the city just to, to fund us as well. Even though it's an important investment, we understand that there needs to be diversity in our revenue streams as well. Yeah, and I guess, on that 
um, it it does seem like a worthwhile investment and given that the city is currently the sole funder uh, that makes me all the more concerned that we're we're uh, we're making sure that the 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 benefits and the uh, the actions that that MDC takes are not aimed solely at businesses, um, but at the community as a whole, in a way. Yeah. And I understand through <coughs> businesses, that's the whole idea. But yeah, I, I hope you understand kind of the. the I do, tenor. and I, I love that you you brought that up too. Um, part of our conversations. Uh, as an organization with the board and myself, uh, we're trying to figure out where do we put the community if they fall under kind of this customer or a stakeholder. Um, and it's, it's tough because as an economic development organization, we the community is a, an essential part of, you know, the economy of success. You know, it's, um, they're interrelated and so, to me, I see the community as almost like our our top stakeholder. We don't, I don't, we don't have community services that we can provide directly to them, but what we do impacts them directly. So to be aware of that and continuing to really be conscious of our decision making and what projects we choose to support, um, that's embedded in in how we you know approach projects as well. We you know it's almost like a litmus of you know what is the community impact? Is it who does it benefit? Um, what is, what's the return on our investment basically of our time? Is it resulting in high quality jobs? Um, it, so we're asking those questions. Um, but that's a very fair point. Um, I just want to make, to note that our customers are the people that we were actually able to assist, um, but we're conscious of how that interplays with the community. And I'm sort of dovetailing on similar questions. I was surprised there was no financial report. Mm. And I guess I do question assuming level funding, especially with not even knowing where you spent the money or if you spent all of it. And concern that in looking at the list, very uh, worthwhile people on your board. I mean, it's great. Mm -hmm. But I do feel there are people left out of the discussion. And back to Glenn's point of where are the workers' conversations and the consumers so that it's a hand it's a balance between not only the employment and the business, but those who are seeking employment mm -hmm. and some input of what they're missing and some of the work conditions that can be enhanced or skills that workers need to have. I think there's a, a cross exchange that needs to happen that both benefit from that I'd hope that you look at in the future. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yep. Uh, Connor. Oh, and then Jack. It sounds like we need some more union organizing drives in town. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, right? um, yeah I, I'm just curious. I've been reading a lot about just uh, co working spaces, right? And how a lot of like tiny towns in Vermont yep. are sort of bringing this on to attract like freelancers, startups, you know, remote workers there. Mm -hmm. um, I was a member of Local 64 for a while. And I, I thought it was like fantastic. You know, for 80 bucks, you could get a desk every month there. So do you think there's like a market for more co-working spaces in town here? It's, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, and I know Lars is kind of the expert in co-working yeah. spaces, so I'd, I'd love to tap his brain about that. Um, but from where I came from in Pennsylvania, they had a hotbed of co-working spaces. And one of the, you know, quote unquote experts um, always embedded it in is there a community that needs it? And how do you cultivate that community first before you actually put investment into a space and providing, you know, beautiful like desks and all these things? Mm -hmm. um, so part of what we need to understand is, is there a need out there? Um, can we generate interest or are people comfortable just, the people who are working remotely are comfortable in their living room? I don't know. So it's hard to judge where that's at. Um, but w I'm working with Dan Groberg from Montpelier Live to start to, we're trying to tap into the entrepreneurial uh, sphere a little bit more to understand what their needs are, because that's another kind of key group that we're not super well connected with. Um, so we just had a meeting this afternoon to start to contemplate some of that. So more to come. Thanks. Yeah. And Jack. 
Hi, Laura. This might be, this is probably a bigger question than we have room for tonight, but I think we could potentially use a bit of a tutorial on how do we evaluate a report like this and, and really even more broadly, how do we evaluate one, not only how, how the MDC is doing, how well it's doing the job, but how is the, is the uh, economy of the city doing? What, mm -hmm. what should we be looking for? And I'm thinking of the business openings and closings you list, and the business openings are really positive, of course. But on the other hand, we, you seem to be talking about net new establishments, yet on the business openings, there are at least a couple of uh, businesses I see that are in the spaces of businesses that closed, and yet those businesses that closed are not listed under the business closings. Mm, yeah, so again, it's not an all-encompassing list, mm -hmm. um, and that's where the data can correct me too. Um, what I know anecdotally, I'm not gonna be able to capture in terms of all of our business openings and closings, um, and some happened before my time, and so again, sure. anecdotally, I didn't know, um, but uh, that's what's helpful with some of the software that we have in place as well, um, to start to record some of that, and with any openings or especially with closings, being able to assess why did they close? Um, and that starts to inform to what's going on in the, how can we color some of what the data is telling us in terms of our economy? Um, and to your first question of evaluating a report like this, um, it is a bit of an evolving thing. Uh, with economic development, it's really hard to track You know what you consider successful. So we can track, economic metric, metrics, um, but it's really, it's hard to make that connection of, you know, we did this and this resulted in, you know, in this. To some extent we can, um, to some extent we can't. Um, what we can do is structure our strategies and our activities uh, around addressing key, key points. So if we want to create more high quality jobs, well, where are, what are existing industry clusters how can we spark or initiate growth in those areas? Um, and to do that, it's understanding what are the current conditions for that industry? What is their capacity to grow? What are some barriers to growth? So there's a lot of layers to it, um, but I, I really would welcome further conversations of how do we assess our activity and what constitutes success? Um, and you know, is our, is our activity worthwhile in, in your eyes? Exactly. Like you this growth in a particular sector what is it that the uh, Montpelier Development Corporation can do to make it happen or to, to help create the conditions in which it'll happen yeah yeah it's, can I jump in there I mean so one hypothesis is that uh, I mean the MDC uh, came out of the economic development um, strategic plan and that had some goals and so I mean, one hypothesis or one way to look at it anyway is like if we hit those targets, then you all have been successful. Right. And uh, I mean, that's not necessarily a wholly valid way to, to look at it, but that is one way to slice it. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure that there is definitively like a, um, you know, a, a way to say like, because as you were saying, like, because, you know, you were doing this that caused this. I mean, there may be some of those relationships, but some of them may that some of them are there there may be a link, but it's, it's, it's just indirect. Mm -hmm. And so it's like hard to necessarily tie it all together like that. So anyway, I, I just want to appreciate what you were saying, uh, uh, being very modest about it. <laughs> so I, I think that's right. I think, yeah. you know, as we, uh, if we tell the uh, Department of Public Works, well, we want to have six miles of uh, roads repaired and at the end of the year, six miles of roads got repaired, we can be pretty sure that it was because the <laughs> Department of Public Works did it. Yeah. Uh, we don't know that right. as clearly with the MDC. Yeah. Right. And there are other variables too. You know, if we hit a recession, we could do a bunch of, th you know, a bunch of really awesome things, but it may not, there's other variables that play into those metrics as well, aside from our activities. Uh, Bill, you might have been doing this, but I think the new counselors need to see that report. Yeah. I mean, it's a very much a learning tool. 
And there's a link to it um, in the report I sent out as well, and it's on their website. Okay. Yep. Yep. I, w I was just going to add a couple things on this too, just to, to weigh in. Um, I, you know, we found MDC in general, but especially since Laura's been here, to be very helpful and um, has picked up in areas, you know, supported our work. I think I, I've seen two projects that just by the nature of timing, they were not able to be out front on. Um, one was Caledonia Spirits, where uh, Laura's predecessor was hired sort of after we were already down the road on that. And the second, of course, was the Capitol Plaza. And, um, and in both cases, I, I could have easily envisioned that the next time around having, you know, the, the legwork that I did or Sue and I did um, would have been much, you know, there were many reasons why it could have been much better if it was done by them, not the least of which is they can have, you know, more freewheeling discussions. Obviously, the city's going to have to always be engaged in those kind of things and would support them, but I think just in terms of workload, and I, I'll just remind people because, you know, you are right, this predates uh, five of the seven people here. But this was a conscious decision made by the city council. There was an emphasis on economic development at the time, in part because if you look at, at that job graph, it had been pretty flat for a number of times. And uh, you know, was we had had some public jobs, but private sector jobs really hadn't grown. And uh, and housing starts and those kind of things. And I think there was you know much like you completed with zoning and to, to create an environment where more things can happen. And there was a in a sense, a sense to do that. And so the plan came, it was approved, and then there was a very conscious decision to create this as a separate corporation and not a city department. And you know, you can argue the pros and cons of that, but that was the decision. And the city council actually drafted and approved the bylaws of this corporation and appointed the board of directors. So to the extent that people like or don't like the board of directors, they were selected by your predecessors and put in, into place. And then and, and so their mission and all of the things that they're doing was a direct product of, of the city and they chose to fund that as opposed to say us hiring lawyer as the city's economic development director and being part of our planning department and working directly with me and all that kind of stuff. It was, it was a, a policy choice to separate it the way it is. So that's just, you know, we can, you know, times change, people change, but that is how, it, why it is structured the way it is. To be. Okay, any further questions? Comments? Thank you, Laura. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, moving on to the uh, sprinkler ordinance amendments uh, for the second public hearing. Uh, just as an FYI team, I'm gumming, gunning for 10 o'clock tonight. That's total. 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 <laughs> yeah, it. That's it. Okay, so. Um, all right, so I'm going to open the public hearing. Um, any comments about changing this? Looks good. Okay, okay, going once. No, yeah, Ashley, looks like you wanted to uh, <laughs> say something. No, no comments from the public. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's been a thing. We should talk about that at some point. <laughs> oh. uh, so do you want me to hold clear, off for you here? The, or, go ahead, Jack. The public hearing we're in now is 18-399, the sprinkler ordinance park, parking structures. Um, this one is for parking structures, yes. Okay, you're, we're good then? Okay, hearing no further comments. Um, I'm going to close the public hearing, and uh, I think we need to adopt this. Adopt. Yes. So do we have a motion? I move that we adopt the uh, parking structure uh, sprinkler ordinance. Amendments. Thank you. Amendments. Is there a second? Second. Oh, you second it. Okay. We had a couple seconds. Great. Uh, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Um, then we have a... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, now we have some uh, parking ordinance amendments. <clears throat> this is also a second hearing. They're a little bit changed from um, the last time, I think. Uh, so I'm going to open the public hearing on these uh, 
parking ordinance amendments. And so <clears throat> any comments from the public or counselors? Yes, Ashley. I would just like to point out, I, at, the, at the last meeting, I raised the issue with the 15-minute parking uh, in front of 78 Berry Street. Um, still says 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, I know that we were kind of looking for some homogeny, homogeneity. Consistency. There you go. <laughs> um, I'm fading fast. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know that it's desirable to have that, but I know that I think the business is only open till two at the latest. Um, and so it's still 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. I know, and I know that that mirrors the uh, further down at like 207 or 209. Yeah. But Do you, what would you suggest we change it to? Um, I would just, you know, if so the original one, from what I remember from the last meeting, that the, the further down on Berry Street, it was, they used to be open till nine, so the parking was the 15 minute parking until they closed, which was at nine. Um, and so I guess my concern with making it until 9 p.m. is that there's no other parking restriction like in that area. And I'm, I, I know that MPD has lots of other things to deal with, but you know, I, I could foresee a world in which someone whatever, you know, and, and it just strikes me as uh, a bit inequitable that the business closes at two, this, the, the purpose of reserving those spots is for the business and then sort of keeping that at 15 minute parking when there are tax, uh, there's a, a tax preparation service across the street from there that could use those spots after two o'clock and it's gonna take more than 15 minutes I think it takes anyone more than 15 minutes to do taxes. Although if someone can do my taxes in 15 minutes, I, I could be more than happy to meet with you. Um, and so I, I just, I, I'm struggling with why it has to be 9 p.m. Uh, uh, Rosie and the Jack. I also believe that we learned last time that the business further down Main Street, the market is not actually open till 9 p.m. anymore. Eight. So it seems like we should at least, I, I see the point of making them um, the same, yeah. but it seems like we could at least move it back till eight if that's the other business. Uh, Jack, I I cert totally see Ashley's point. On the other hand, um, I <clears throat> I kind of think that it makes sense to have it be a standard span of time rather than to be jumping in and out of the ordinances every time a business changes, and so calling it something like five o'clock might might be a way to uh, to address that um i have a question will we stop uh the Meters. metered Stops enforcement as at, uh, at five right that was why i thought of five yeah, yeah okay um i well, sorry yeah build yeah well i think some of the complaints at the store at least are, have been after five because when people come home from work and run in there's been a lot of conflict there over over the years um, so just saying that I'm not saying you have to keep them the same or anything else but moving them both to five isn't going to help the store and it might okay. help this one so further comments uh, Don Tom do you have an opinion <laughs> um, I believe it was you actually Donna that um, was uh, suggested and, and I believe you checked the minutes um, from the last meeting unless I misunderstood um, <laughs> that he the, remembers I was there. That the suggestion was that um, it would be generic and we wouldn't have to alter it, as Jack was just saying, for depending on the store, and that I was directed to make them both 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, so it's your prerogative, but we did notify the store and everybody that this was the time period. <clears throat> so. That's the only opinion I have is that we weren't, um, this is what I understood the city council had asked for, um, and this is what we notified the property owners and businesses that we would be doing, that they would be both the same and that it would be generic um, no matter what store or business was there. So I have a hypothesis, which is that we should maybe change that ending time to at least not 
9 p.m., maybe 8 at the early, uh, I'm sorry, at the latest. And um, if we can have a third public hearing on this and notify them again with a different language. Um, what do you think about that team? I guess no, I'm just going to I'm going to ask that pragmatic question which is what would enforcement look like after 5 p.m. I believe um, is the chief still here? I, yeah, yeah I've, <laughs> I I kind of figured that. Sorry, chief. And I know he'll answer this, but my my hunch is that there's not going to be any active enforcement, but when someone is parked in front of the store, you know, someone's complaining, I think we're going to end up refereeing again that right. there's no place for me to park when I'm trying to go to the store. Well, I'm not saying, I'm saying if we were to leave it as is, and let's say that someone's getting their taxes done or someone has, you know, walked down to Buddy's Burgers or whatever and they're parked there for more than 15 minutes, what would enforcement look like after 5 p.m.? Pretty much what Sid Mayor just said. It, it's, um, we get a complaint and then what we will do just to make sure to, to alleviate problems, we will time time it okay. ourselves and come back via, you know if the vehicle is still there so they can get bonus time if you if you will but we found um, for the the business further up the street years ago when it was uh, kind of an issue and if we get tied up on a call so be it you know we're just not gonna come back and issue with you know if we see the car is still there after the officers deal with a, a call uh, it's not a priority for us Rosie. That said, I don't think that we should have ordinances on our books that we don't plan to enforce. And so if it's just like we're, if this is here and we're not going to. I want to be clear. We're not, I'm not saying that we no, won't enforce I, it. I understand that, but I think that was kind of the implication that. Well, it just, I mean, that. it just seems, and I, I appreciate why the bakery, I think it was the bakery that raised this, right? Is that? Um, that was but, the original. Um, yeah, Bohemian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. And so, you know, further down, Buddy's patrons who want to park on Barry Street there have to pay for parking. Then the tax preparation service that was my old neighbor, right at, what is that, 71 Barry Street? Himself. Yeah. And also that office building, although it's, I'm not sure if it's still an office building on the corner of uh, Hubbard and Barry Street, um, you know, they don't get 15-minute parking. And, and so I guess if the issue is, uh, you know, well... 15 minute parking has to happen in front of these two businesses on Barry Street. Why isn't every business on Barry Street getting 15 minute parking, you know, in front of them? Um, and then, uh, you know, sort of the other piece to this is if they're only open till two and, you know. I so would you prefer, I'm trying to like, you know, what what, what is your suggestion? So what I'm, may, correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like you would actually like this to be a separate Sentence so that it, it it might not it might actually not be consistent. Like if the if Barry Street Market is open later, then they get the later time, and this other space for now not open that late maybe has a different time, and uh, businesses may change and we might revisit it. Yes, I mean and and I I appreciate that that might not be the most desirable thing. It just seems like you know. There are other businesses there who who also have people that drive to them. And I don't have strong feelings about this. What do other people think? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm on the fence. Uh, like on one hand, yeah, I, I do feel it's a bit ridiculous to have the 15 minute parking for a seven hour period. You know, while we're waiting for the business to, or it's already been shut down. At the same time, I don't want to be coming back. Like if the business changes it to like a three o'clock closure and we have to reopen this anytime. I don't know if there's a way to just like delegate the authority on this type of stuff. We <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> spent a lot of time talking about like uh, one's parking spot, you know? Yeah. We, we have these smart meters. Cannot we set it to be 15 minutes for no this much time? It's a non-metered area. There's no yeah, there's no meters there. Oh. We don't go that far down right. on Berry no. Street. Stops just before the senior, senior center. Senior Donna um, wants to install can I, meters. Uh, <laughs> do you think we should rewarn? If we change it, do you think we should? Well, if we change it, we should rewarn. I mean, you can't. You don't have to, but it would be good to note it. Just in case they're concerned. Really, um, you know. I, I feel so like... So, team, I, my inclination... I'm sorry. I, I just... 
it's it's an equity thing for me. Yeah. It's like balancing all of the interests of business needs and parking accessibility for sure, but also like residents that don't have parking there, you know, like. So, uh, okay, here's what I'm gonna recommend. <laughs> um, uh, let's separate out these two spaces and uh, let's make the, the end time for the spot in front of Bear Street Market to end at 8 p.m. and the spot in front of um, the bakery to end at, I, I guess I would say 5 p.m. Um, just to make it consistent with the rest of the um, um, the metered spaces and if we can rewarn um, uh, the uh, property owners abutting there uh, and then we can revisit it. Would that be okay? That's totally cool. I just have like a, a practical question. Like how far, so the, the meter folks, they yeah. do it on foot, right? Yeah. I mean, do they walk down or is it usually MPD? They, they have a, well, they have a car. It's one of the things we're kind of challenged with at the moment. Um, Cause right now they're, they're using the, the, the detective vehicle. Um, that has to change uh, down the road, so they'll be getting one of the old cars. So they'll have a vehicle to them. We actually, mm -hmm. uh, so. But generally, okay. most of their work is done by foot. Right. And it's in, and it's pretty much in the designated yeah. downtown. Yeah. Correct. Okay. And the officers okay. also will augment. Though, if there's a call, you know, hydrant violation up off of West Street, um, you know, mm -hmm. we're probably going to set an officer will deal with that too. Okay. Any further comments? Okay. Well, I'm not Should clear what you've change? asked. To it so uh, it do we need a motion to change this? Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. It would be helpful so for clarity block, since so okay. you had a motion last week. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if people like my suggestion, but okay. it's consistent. With, it, it adds consistency with the rest of the parking enforcement. So it's good by me. If okay. It's good by. It's so compromise. I think we need a motion. Who's making it? <laughs> I will move that. <laughs> To be clear, Tom. that we so the seven to five in front of the bakery, the and seven to nine in front of the or seven to so eight, eight in front of the yes. store. Yes. yes. Well, I don't know okay. The bakery the store um, till five. So, can we use addresses? I, I just yeah. Seventy-eight. So it's, the, um, it's two hundred seven to two hundred nine is further down. I, I two hundred three to two hundred five is so seventy-eight Berry Street. Are the two front? Oh, I'm sorry. Two right, in front right. of seventy-eight Berry. <laughs> Oh. So that we designate the parking hours for the two spots in front of 207 to 209 Berry Street be from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. And that the two spots. 8, 8, 8 p.m. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> 8. And then the two spots in front of 78 Berry Street um, from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Does the start time for the rest of the parking downtown is that that's at eight, isn't eight. it? Not seven. So, is oh, for the meters, for meters. paying, it's eight o'clock. Yes, eight to five. Um, Sorry, shall we do that. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Shall we change it to eight um, a.m.? Yes. Can I add something? Yes, please. please. We want it at seven, right? I don't know. Yeah. The original complaint request was that all day parkers are using the spaces in front of seventy-eight to 80, uh, 82 don't know what time they arrive um, so is that a concern that was what we're trying to do is respond to that request from a business that that uh, one of uh, Chief Fakus's officers investigated and there's been a long-standing issue about a very number few number of spaces and it's been gone going on for years um, quite literally so um, I think the seven changing it to eight may be problematic. Okay. Um, if somebody misses the sign, they're parking yep. there for the day and doing that for a long time. Okay, cool. sounds fair. So we're going to keep keep it at seven. Okay. Yeah. And I support uh, that as well. Okay. Um, did we? Uh, so Ashley second. moved that. Did we have a second? Second. For the discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Nick. Okay. Um, <laughs> Just the whole process. <laughs> <laughs> and then continue second reading with that in a minute. The next yes. Can, can I ask yep. a clarifying question? Yeah. I think I heard somebody say it's a separate section. Am I supposed to separate these two or no. retain them? And I think it just leave them the two sentences as they are okay. currently written. Just change the times right. to reflect yeah. that. Yeah. But on the second okay. Tuesday of the week. <laughs> <laughs> it's really only the second half of the okay. second Tuesday. Find any humor in that. We're moving on. This is a lot of work, actually. So. <laughs> so, 
On to a, a budget discussion. And, and, the, and the next <laughs> Thank you, Tom. hearing sure. is not oh, going yes. to be on January 2nd because that's strictly a budget meeting. It's going to be so, on uh, January 9th? January 9th. Okay. To move to set that. I think we do. Uh, well, I so, we set it. Um, so I'm going to close the public yes. hearing in case we didn't <laughs> note we that. Um, Jack, I, you want to make a motion to that effect? Yes, I move we set the, the next public hearing for this uh, for the regular meeting on January 9th, 2019. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Who seconded my okay. motion? <coughs> there was. There was. Gun's on okay. fire with them tonight. <laughs> I can second them. Looking out <laughs> for those <laughs> District 3 interests. So. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> I had such high hopes for an early night tonight. I will note, however, that the veteran department heads who know never miss any budget discussion. <laughs> 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 no matter how late or how uh, overviewing Sir. it was supposed to be, uh, they've learned. Uh, so I think I said out to you earlier my goals for tonight you may have different goals but one is to go through this presentation you have the budget books on your uh, desks which are your holiday reading uh, but it's just all the detail backing up what we're talking about um, to have obviously question and answer and maybe some feedback from the overview last week and the little play sheet you guys have had to work with and then uh, as we gear up for the second which I think can be a really productive night um, make sure we're focused on the things you want to be focused on for, for that meeting. So if there's specific information that you want or, um, you know, a question you want answered for that night, we can identify that or, or, you know, we're already planning to have the chief here and he's here tonight too. People want to talk chief of police. Um, the fire chief will be here because he always comes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Jeff Byers here too. Those are, the, those are the two areas where we had the biggest staffing changes. So, um, for the extent that people want to talk about that. So uh, this is just the overview of the budget. Our, our goal with the budget is to implement the strategic plan that you adopted earlier this year, continue our capital equipment funding plan, and, and deliver responsible services. Just as a reminder, and I'm not going to talk through this, but we did adopt a strategic plan, which included um, values, you know, staff mission and values, as well as strategic outcomes and then activities under that. And we do use that as a guide a lot. And um, so we'll just walk through this budget a little bit. Now I'll say before I go into these individual items that, that I'm not addressing everything that we put in the strategic plan, I'm only showing how those items that are in the budget reflect it. So there will be many other activities, such as the plastic bag ban that you've already adopted, uh, something you did, there's no budget on that. So so community prosperity, um, the, the tax rate, at least for the base budget, is at um, approximate CPI, 2.3. Uh, we did include $100,000 in funding for economic development that we just talked about. It's keeping our planning and zoning staff um, as we implement our new zoning and master plan. They're doing a, a lot of things and implements our TIF district through, uh, it's going to be some extra work for our finance department and those kind of things. Uh, our environmental stewardship, we've included the $5,000 from MEAC. We've uh, talked about a new facilities and energy position to begin in April. Uh, we talked last night at uh, C or last night, Monday night at CIP at length. We are including stormwater projects in some discussion. The GMT circulator bus is included, although it sounds like uh, there may be changes coming to that. Uh, and the energy planning grant is something we're hoping to accomplish through uh, actually current funding. Um, to seek to, to develop an energy plan with funding sources. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, our, our inclusive, equitable, and welcoming community, we funded the Community and Arts Fund uh, at a slightly higher number than last year. The feast program at the Senior Center remains uh, in place. The Montpelier Alive and our community enhancements programs, those are all things that contribute to our livability, I guess you'd say. Sustainable infrastructure, we funded our CIP and equipment plan as scheduled with another $50,000 increase from last year. The water sewer plan is being followed as well. That's also another infrastructure plan. We're including, again, a facilities. Uh, it's not a different one. It's the same one. And our complete streets is included uh, in the CIP as well as in the, the parking fund. Um, those on the CIP know we'll be looking at maybe the way that's structured in the future, but for now that's the way it's set up for this year. 
thoughtfully built, uh, plan, plan, thoughtfully planned, built environment. Uh, we've included the downtown improvement district again in our funding for downtown projects, and of course we have a lot of projects on the books that are going to be spending a lot of time on. So we don't have a lot new for that. More housing, we've included $75,000 for the Housing Trust Fund, and of course with the TIF implemented, that is a, can support housing projects. Public Health and Safety, we're adding an additional police officer. We've included uh, funding that would cover public events. Our flood gauges are uh, included again, although we are looking at maybe alternatives for measuring flood, flood things. Our paramedic program continues to expand, basically, uh, the chief has implemented a paramedic program in the fire department, and as we replace people, we try to bring in new paramedics. We haven't you know, required everybody to change, so it grows slightly every time we have a, a staff change. And Project Safe Catch and other uh, drug related, uh, drug prevention related activities are continuing. In the responsive and responsible government, we've continuing our communications efforts that we've tried to ramp up over the last couple of years. Our employee wellness program is included. Uh, all of our service levels are maintained at current levels. Our bridge articles included. This year we implemented the Invisio dashboard and the monthly reporting as well as the tool for ourselves and that's happening. Um, we have a program that you will hear more about as the year unfolds that you don't know anything about now called Access Montpelier. Uh, this is uh, using our GIS program and other programs. We looked at uh, what, well, for lack of better words, there are a couple of brand name programs like C Click Fix and Q Alert. Um, we actually discovered that we have the ability to create that on our own without spending the money. Uh, and some of it had to do with the grant that we got through um, Stone Environmental. That, that uh, So, DPW, Zach, and uh, Corey and Ryan in particular under Tom's leadership are really taking this on and so they're they've they're taking they've given we've sort of given them a six month window to see if they can pull it off and if they can't uh, and we think they can they're confident they can and I've seen their demos and I, I think they can as well um, so we're hopeful to do that so there is no money in the budget for those kinds of services but we're, we're hopeful that we're going to do it and basically, we've got three areas that we need to use reserve funds for. Um, I just rounded it to 50000 but I'd like to do a citizen survey this year that when you've seen the funding and the, bud the, the, and the potential budget options, that's really f to start setting aside for future years. I think we said we'd like to do our strategic planning effort again this year, and this would be either funding or providing match funds for a grant for an energy plan. So it may not be as much as 50000 for those three, but... Uh, that would be the highest it would look like. So those aren't in your line budgets, but those are, are activities that are on the radar. Looking at our strategic plan, because we do actually use these, this is, these are items that um, you said, we said, in the spring that we wanted to look at come budget time. Uh, so one, and these are just in the order they're written in the plan. I don't know if they're in a priority order. Upgrade the streetlights to LED. We have spent some time on that. We talked about it with the, the uh, CIP committee. Um, we're looking at the costs and benefits and tax credits and repayments and all that. We are, uh, DPW is committed to a proposal for next year's budget and or earlier if we find that it has a positive payback and maybe could be done in a way that doesn't require bonding. Uh, consider a net zero fund benefit charge. Again, I think we'd like to seek a planning grant to actually write an energy independence plan for us and, um, and including how we might fund that. So that would be part of the plan. Uh, seeking funding to expand our COSA, that circle of support, support and accountability. Thank you to work with DCF families. Uh, actually, we have some uh, an active proposal before the state right now for uh, a couple pilots on that. Uh, that would be a new service area and presumably would be mostly state funded. Um, prioritize non-fossil fuel-based vehicles and equipment plan. And these are actually two separate things. I combine them into one. Um, we had a long, robust conversation about this the other night. Um, <laughs> and we are looking at alternatives. There is a fuel option, which could or might not require significant fleet changes. And we're, and then there's one that might. And so we're weighing those, those differences. Um, one Taylor Street to develop and fund a maintenance plan. As I said, we don't expect this to be open until October. Um, the, uh, 
the initial operations of the, the transit center will be, uh, the maintenance will be done by GMT, who will be the, the tenant, uh, although we can't charge them rent. Uh, the housing portion will be managed by Downstreet. Uh, in terms of long-term funding and maintenance, again, we need to make sure the facility's position, identifying those needs and putting them into the building capital plan. So there's no specific funding right now. Police staffing and training, uh, we have, we've looked at that and we're proposing a new position. Replace aging fire vehicles. I think that was put out there as a, just a heads up that those things aren't cheap and we've got a big million dollar one coming up in the next few years. Um, there is nothing in, in this year's budget other than funding for the bonding for that vehicle is planned for in our equipment plan in the next, I think once the bonding for the present one runs out, we'll start the next one. Facility management, as I, I feel like I'm saying this a lot, but we do have a position considered in the budget and funding to increase, uh, to address some facility needs in our CIP. Finally, it was community services and integration and staffing. We do have an additional tree position in the budget, an additional parks position on the options list. We did take a hard look at what we could do for integration. We were pretty satisfied that um, that if we were going to add positions, it ought to be in these service areas and not at the top. We may have a retirement this year, which would give us an opportunity to look at the administrative functions. But most of the actual on the you know, sort of hands-on positions are already working across all three divisions, if you will: parks, seniors, and rec. And so we see that as working fairly well right now, and uh, that the, the pressing needs are really in the trees and, and the actual parks. So those were the list we said we were going to look at. That's where we came out on these. Obviously, you've, we've talked about this last week, but you have I just consolidated it down to make it even easier to read. But uh, these are the what's sort of in play that you've identified and we've had requests for um, that presumably we'll be talking about over the next couple of weeks. What's the difference of this citizen survey? What's the difference of this citizen survey and the one you had tucked in the fifty thousand? The difference is that the, the, the survey is about $15,000. So what I'd like to do is do one this year, get a baseline, and then set $5,000 a year for the next three years and do another one in three years so that we can continue. The last one we did was in 2009. So I it's know, quite but you dated. listed it under the reserve fund. Yes, so, so right. I, what I'm saying is I'd like, I, ideally we would pay for one now from reserve and do it this year. Okay. And then set 5000 next year, 5000 the year after, 5000 the year after that, and do another one in three years so we can compare the data and do that on a every three-year cycle. So this, this yeah, would be setting up for the next one. Okay. So, yes, there are two separate yep. things. So good question. Um, these, these are all in your, um, in your book, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. This shows you where our money comes from to fund the budget. This shows you how we're spending it. Uh, this shows you another way of how we're spending it. So rather than by uh, department, it cuts it apart by uh, your personnel, equipment, capital in that way. So you can see, again, I've mentioned this many years, but we are a personnel-driven operation, which is one reason why those costs. I mean, we can automate, we can do all these things, but it's still people that drive plows, still people that answer fire and ambulance calls, it's still people that are in police cruisers, and still people that wait on folks. So we're always going to have people and doing these jobs. There are people that are fixing trees and all those other things. Um, this is, if we took the budget as it's laid out, and this is what the average person would be paying per service, uh, it shows up better in your book than it does on the screen. But it just, it's just interesting to see that, you know, um, you know people are paying $500 for police services. That seems pretty reasonable to me and some of these other things. So it's a good way to, when you look at it, in the aggregate what, what you're getting for each individual service. Um, so uh, basically the impact, the property tax rate is would be up by 2.6 cents or 2.3%. Uh, the average, so for an average tax bill of $57. District heat rates, you recently approved those. The water and sewer, um, our, our long-term plan calls for uh, inflation plus 1%, so that would put it at around 3.5% this year, uh, and that is to fund the long-term capital needs. 
and then we don't see any change required this year for sewer benefit or the CSO sewer water sewer or CSO benefits um, we have talked a little bit about the CSO and whether that should be restructured for funding stored water differently but uh, for now we're, we're getting what we need so we have our meeting tonight we have a workshop on January 2nd public hearings on uh, January 9th and January 24 Thursday you can still dis just because you hold a public hearing we can still make discussions discussions and changes although there are other items on agendas that night such as Barry Street parking um, that could, could <laughs> <laughs> and I was just noting that that was on the agenda and to, <laughs> might impact our budget discussion. Um, and then, of course, the voting um, on March 5th with the early voting to start in mid. I guess I never got a chance to finish the typing that. I'll take care of that. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> must have got interrupted. Um, so, that's my presentation. Um, as I said, we're happy to go back and review any of it with you or take general questions. Uh, we do have some staff here to answer specific questions and then how, whatever you want to structure a discussion about. Uh, so just to frame this up a little bit, it, um, yeah, this, so this time would be f uh, time for questions about the budget, and, um, but then... And, any, so, and if we can answer them tonight, we okay. will. If there are specific pieces of information you'd like for the second and people that you'd like mm -hmm. there we can so I'm wondering if it's useful to do any um, I you know talking through what are um, of the other options that we might want yep. um, if we yep. if we get to that still gunning for 10 o'clock okay um, Rosie and then Ashley so I want to read my budget book before we have that discussion okay. so I would like to push that one off okay um, two questions that you can answer now or later um, I'm curious about how we're doing on our reserve funds. I know you're talking about drawing from them, and I just don't have a good sense of where we're at. Right, and we're still looking at that, too. We did spend a lot of them this year, so that that would impact, you know, we might have to, to not do some of those things, but they are, they're all priority things. To, I mean, probably I would say the survey would be the one we wouldn't do out of those, even though I think it's important. Um, but we did buy the Conniff property, and we... Um, you know, we put money out for TIF, which we will get back, but that still comes from the reserves. So, so I, you know, on the other hand, we are seeing um, some building fees above and beyond um, what was budgeted. In fact, ironically, we're going to be one of the biggest contributors um, <laughs> between one Taylor and um, the parking structure. Those are both like hundred thousand dollar fees, and the hotel. So we will see some surplus in the in the. The general fund as well um, but yeah it's, it, that's a great question it's we're definitely keeping our eye on it okay um, and the other one is I'm sure we heard this earlier but I can't remember what the five thousand dollars for MIAC was for what they specifically wanted to do with it I don't if somebody can just forward me the email again I'm sure there was one or we can have point. Kate maybe come yeah uh, we can see if we can find out. They, they've had that funding for the last couple of years. I think mm -hmm. it was oh, I there. thought you were saying it was a new. No, no it was no. just continued. From they put it out years. as a loan and get it back. No, no that's, that's something else. That's, oh, that's something, something else. Something else. Okay. Yeah. So no, they've had that in their budget for the last couple of years. And they use it for miscellaneous you know, studies. Or the, I guess I just want to know match. what it's used for. It could be yep. used as the grant match for the plan, for example. Okay. Um, so. uh, Ashley. Uh, so I have a, a couple of questions, although I think that they are pretty straightforward. Um, so if my math is correct, it looks like over, for, so we've granted three tax stabilizations over the last year, in essence. Um, and so if my math is right, it comes out to a little over $64,000 in tax abatements for this tax year, assuming that, that the, you know, the property would have, they would have paid you know, whatever those taxes were in full this year. Um, so again, my math brings it down to the, the difference between last year's budget and this year's budget. So if those full taxes, that $64,154 had been paid, that would have brought the difference um, to, if I read this right, it would have been like uh, $205,369. Okay. Um, and so I guess what I'm asking is how, like, could you give us the numbers for the difference between what 
what the tax rate would have looked like if we hadn't done those stabilization projects versus what it looks like. Um, I can give you a rough estimate. Okay. Um, so assuming the 64,000, and I'm, I'm not sure they're all completed, so they wouldn't right. necessarily so it wouldn't be, be taxed full, but at the full amount right. for this year. Yep. I, I figured um, that was the case, but I'm just sort of running the numbers on that. So that would be about 0.7 cents. Uh, okay. One cent is about eighty-seven thousand dollars, so it'd be about point seven three cents that that's worth. So, okay. if it was two point six cents, then it would be one point nine cents. Okay. Uh, so, and that on. Um, Bill, you're getting softer, or oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what was the What was the amount? I'm it was sorry. about two point seven cents. So. So it's probably about sixteen dollars for the average per per pro average per resident. Okay. The, the two hundred twenty-eight thousand median home price. Okay. So six sixteen roughly. Roughly. Um, okay. And thank you for that. I, sorry. Thank you for understanding what I was saying. Cause I'm not sure I understood what I was saying the whole time. Um, the other question that I had, um, in terms of there are like special. Uh, lines in the budget for you know certain events and things like that um, if there were a proposal to leave the funding the same but to allocate that differently what's the best way to put that request um, in writing so it wouldn't be a dollar amount change it would just be you know instead of using it for this I'd like to propose that we use it for this other purpose that's related to that but serves a, a wider group of people rather than a Smaller. So you could simply make a motion to that if you wanted to okay. send it around in advance sure. so people had it. But I mean that is right. your job is to allocate funds. You can, so the council can add to the budget. You can subtract from the budget. You can move money around in the budget as you see fit. Okay. Um, I mean within. I mean obviously you can't change debt amounts and right. things like that. But, <laughs> right. Uh, no, it's um, it's a small. It's like related to. Yeah. No, I know, but I just want to be clear. The the process right. is. You know, I've recommended a budget to you, and you've laid out your options. And then, what goes to the voters that you'll approve on January 24 is the city council's budget. So you work from this. You can. Some years it's gone exactly as proposed. Other years it's been changed drastically. Other years it's been changed subtly. So I mean, that is what you then layer your policy priorities over the staff recommendation. Other questions, Connor. Just in the category of no surprises, you know, for the January 2nd meeting. I've spoken to you, Bill. I just spoke to Bob, too. I, I think I, it's a good thing there's seven of us because I probably add staff in every department. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the one I can't get out of my head is, um, you, you know, maybe the need, we're putting so much on EMS and fire there. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the budget line items there, and I see $192,000 in overtime. I, I think I'd just like a little more going to, into depth in those numbers, knowing that, you know, it can be time and a half, it can be double time, depending on what hour people are called in. If you added another position for, I think the first step's under $40,000, probably with Benny's 70 some thousand dollars, how much would it eat into that $192,000 number? So I just asked for a, an analysis on that. Um, yeah, and we could do just that. Just like to give it a closer look. We can, we can certainly do that, and I don't think it would actually make I mean, given the way the, the call-ins work for calls and mm -hmm. number of people on, on calls, mm -hmm. and a lot, some of that is backfilling for people when they're out on vacation. So if we're going to add a new person, are we going to backfill for them when they're mm -hmm. gone? And so, I, you know, we, we have certainly spent a lot of time looking at that. I will tell you, uh, and, and we will do more of this, I'm sure, but um, when I started here in 95, our overtime budget was about what it is right now and um, higher and we actually took to about till about two years ago when it finally caught up with the way we rear we rearranged staff with the help of the fire department it wasn't just me but putting people at key times so we didn't have to call in as much so we've actually reduced our overtime considerably and I think what we have to understand is that in our emergency, actually, not only in our emergency departments, but in DPW, overtime is a necessary evil. I mean, it, it's not even an evil, it's actually an efficient way to staff um, people because you don't have the benefit costs, you don't have all those other things, and, um, and it is re replacing, it is responding to, to calls and things. So we can certainly look at that, and 
Um, I'm not sure we would. I don't think we would save dollar for dollar. But I okay. could I could be wrong about that. Yeah, I'd just like to think yep. a little bit. Sure. Other comments, Jack. I've uh, the number one thing that I've heard about. I mentioned this to you, to you and to the chief in an email. The number one comment I've heard from constituents is a question about the additional uh, police officer. Um, so I think that's a topic of discussion that we should uh, be having. Yeah, and we assume that we, you know, Chief, I think, is prepared to make a presentation. I'm sure he can answer general questions now, but I know he's planning to mm -hmm. present on that on the second. And we assume similar with the, you know, the tree position, but, you know, mm -hmm. anything else. Uh, but yeah, and there are very good logical explanations. The other thing I would say is that uh, the people I talk to also agree that the chief comes with a tremendous amount of credibility based on the experience the city has with him over many years. Yeah, I would say, you know, simply, uh, and, and I agree with all of that about the chief, um, all, all of our department heads, um, but, you know, in some regards, too, we had 17, and it was cut two or three, four years ago, and one was cut, and I think they've been struggling ever since, and we've been able to support with a basically a grant-funded position working with the state drug task force, so we've been kept as a city officer but not paid for ourselves, so we actually have had the 17th doing investigative work, and that program is ending, so to actually go to 16 would be an, a reduction, to, to not fill it would be a reduction in the type of service that we're seeing and I think he can explain that much more detail than I can Great, thanks. Donna um, I definitely want to talk to the park department and last night attending the park commission meeting there's more and more demands from the bike group they did another petition to the parks to expand to fat bikes you know that fat mm -hmm. bikes um, and so I think we, we may have some staff changing there but the staff need and some of the infrastructure need is really, I think, worth hearing. So I, I'd like them to come forward. Yeah, and as I said, we were planning to have them here. Further comments? Okay. Uh, I'm going to assume that we're running out of time. Um, so. So I parks, police, and fire. Parks, police, and fire. Um, one note, there was a, a question um, from the Energy Committee as to whether or not it would be useful to have an energy coordinator from a different city come um, tell us about what it, his job is like. And I thought that might be useful, seeing as we might be hiring someone to do that work. What do you think, team? Would that be of value? Yeah. I've, oh, okay, yeah. great. So I just want to put that on the on the, on the list. <laughs> for the, well, we can, we can talk about that more, too, but um, yes, Donna. As part of our budget discussion, are you thinking, or I guess we have so much to do within our budget, I would love to have that afterwards, mm -hmm. but I feel there's a solid support for facility energy. Well, so one question position. is, are we going to support it at 0.25 FTEs, basically, or at a full-time position? Well, so that, that to me the is... The assumption at yeah. the point two five is just that it's starting partway through the year, mm -hmm. not that it's a quarter-time position. It's a full-time position that we are planning to fully fund in future years. So do we start it now or later? That's part That's of the one question. one of those options. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Bring him. Okay. <coughs> um, Jack, did you have a comment about that? Okay. No, I was just going to say the same thing. I wasn't okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Great. Yeah, very helpful. Thank all of you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we I are. Bob is Bob still here? Sorry, Bob. Moving on sure to council reports. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Uh, let's uh, let's start with Ashley. You can go. Oh. Yeah. I had a thing. I forgot it. Do you want to come back? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't have. Okay. <laughs> um, just want to mention that I um, was chatting with Bill today about um, making sure that we are clear to the public that we accept comments for public hearings in writing. So we often say that when somebody is being a little bit long-winded in their comment, but I think we should also promote that 
on our agendas um, as a, you know, for people who aren't going to show up, um, a way to contribute to the conversation. Um, and it sounded like that was doable and we could maybe make that happen, but I just Great. wanted to highlight that for other folks. Great. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Donna, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wanted to bring everyone's attention. One of the slides Bill brought up reminded me of his reminder that we have a mission statement and values that I'll incorporate it into the draft for our evaluations. I used someone else's. And so I'll just incorporate that. And I haven't gotten any feedback, but what questions you, I know, maybe after the budget gets done. But you know, what questions you like, I mean, what questions you want to add, a perspective that would be really helpful. Uh, but this week with the CIP on Monday, the parks on Tuesday, and MTAC last week, I just want to say we have a lot of good feelings out there for the things that we're looking at for options, hearing very clearly about some staff needs and lighting needs and other things and d more discussion with GMT. So I think I'm really pleased at the direction we're moving and appreciate all the time you're all putting in. Thank you. Uh, not much, uh, just a little inspiration. Um, I think it shows that even though we're a small city, we can cast a long shadow <laughs> and had some outreach from uh, a group in Worthington, Massachusetts. Uh, who would like to ban plastic bags in their town, so it was reaching out to citizens against plastic pollution in town here uh, to help them set up a process for that. So, nice. yeah, it was good to make a difference other places. Um, I uh, want to register that uh, we're right in the middle of a pretty busy season for downtown businesses, and so I am only about a quarter here uh, um, and I really have been appreciating all of the work that I'm seeing everyone else doing and I wish that I had more specific comments on a lot of these things and they're coming but uh, longer hours than usual and, and more intense work at, uh, at, at the day job recently so um, it's all fun uh, and I just feel really sleepy Tomorrow morning, I will be uh, <laughs> back to full power and up and alert. Uh, and join me at Baguito's at 8.30 to 9.30 to talk about this and everything else. Thank you. Ashley? Yes. Um, so one of the things that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, I've worked with uh, youth in, in my prosecutorial career, but also in, in my other life before becoming a lawyer. Um, and I just want to underscore how impressed I was with the young people who showed up tonight. Um, and one of the things that I am interested in doing as a city is actually engaging more young people in the work uh, that we are doing. And I, I'm, I have some ideas for what that could look like, um, including maybe like a listening tour that uh, really sits down with uh, young people and sort of listens to them about what they want for their city because we do that, you know, we, we do that with lots of groups about transportation and infrastructure and uh, things like that. And, um, you know, looking at, at the, the data that Laura showed us tonight, we're losing people. And uh, if we want to get people to stay, I think we have to really cultivate that. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested in hearing ideas from the community and from other people about how we can best get that input and, and what that sort of looks like. I, uh, sorry, but I just wanted to jump on that because there was one other thing in Laura's presentation, not in the slides, but in her um, in the part that she, she sent to us about the breakdown of the ages of people in Montpelier. And it was interesting to me to look at that and kind of see, uh, I, I think that there's a perception that, that we're an, an older and aging city. And it looked to me from that chart uh, like that perception may be mistaken. Uh, there are a lot of younger people here. I was kind of breaking it down and it looked like we are something like 60% under 50. Yep. So just. Um, I have no update. Everybody looks a little tired. I'll let Bill go on ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work on the mayor's 10 o'clock deadline. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then. Uh, then without objection, we will consider the meeting adjourned. Thank you.